Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Gorodnik, Chair of the City Planning Commission. Welcome to our review session of August 8th. Maybe the dog days of August, but not here at the City Planning Commission. We have a lot going on. Um, welcome to our review session today. Typically for our review sessions, we look at projects that are uh, being certified in public review. Uh, today, we have um, a couple of interesting uh, presentations coming our way, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and plenty to talk about. Uh, and uh, the first thing I wanted to do is give a warm welcome to our newest city planning commissioners, David Gold, who was appointed by the mayor, and Juan Camilo Osorio, who was appointed by the Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso. Uh, welcome to both of you, David and Juan. We're looking forward uh, to working with you. David comes to us from uh, the finance and real estate world, and Juan is a professor at Pratt. Welcome to you both. Let me give you a, a quick uh, chance to say hello and introduce yourself. Uh, we'll just do this alphabetically. And Commissioner Gold, welcome. Good to have you here. Hey, thank you, Chair Gorodnik, and, and thanks to everyone. I very much look forward to working with, with you all, with all the other commissioners, as well as everyone else so, and the department. So thank you very much. And uh, I, I can't tell you how happy I am to join. We're really excited to be working with you. And uh, Commissioner Osorio. Thanks so much, Chair Gorotnik, for the warm welcome. Uh, and I especially want to thank the staff for all the support and the onboarding process. Thanks, uh, really, it's a real privilege to be joining the City Planning Commission at this point, and I really look forward to learning and collaborating with all the commissioners and the staff in this process. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you both. Uh, and, um, well, we've got a, a couple of presentations, as I noted uh, up front, special presentations today. The first is from the uh, Department of Design and Construction. Uh, they are going to update us on the design guidelines for the Bronx site in the Bronx borough, in the borough-based jails program and talk about uh, their guidelines. The second uh, is from the Landmarks Preservation Commission. Uh, and they're gonna go over a couple of proposed historic districts in Cambria Heights, Queens. We'll have a public hearing on those um, districts uh, before the commission on Wednesday. Um, and after those presentations, the staff of the department is going to brief the commission on two projects that are coming to us for a hearing on Wednesday. The first is a, a biggie, Innovation Queens. Uh, this is a proposal uh, to transform five blocks in Astoria uh, into a mixed use development with more than 2,800 new residential units, commercial space, community facility use, and over two acres of open space. Um, this uh, is a project that has gotten significant public and media attention, uh, and we are really looking forward to hearing directly uh, from uh, the uh, applicant and from the public uh, this Wednesday. Uh, second, we're gonna hear about a project in East New York, uh, which would enable two new buildings, uh, one with 191 units, the other with 560 units, 100% uh, affordable project, both located within the Fresh Creek urban renewal area. And after that, we're gonna have some updates on projects that we have previously heard, uh, including uh, on the Lirio, the HPD project in Hell's Kitchen. Um, just to, to update uh, the commission, the project was approved in the council by the zoning subcommittee and land use committee a couple of weeks ago, uh, and will go before the city council for a vote soon. Uh, and I would like to uh, thank the council, including Speaker Adams and Councilmember Botcher, uh, and the community for helping to create a project here that, that will provide uh, an opportunity for housing to a wide variety of New Yorkers. And this one is coming to us for a scope determination only today, a scope determination. So, David, Juan, Commissioners, Gold, Asorio, officially a good day to start. Welcome again. Uh, and I'm now going to turn uh, to Ryan. Ryan, go ahead and take it away. Yes, good afternoon. Um, so before we begin our regular agenda, uh, we do have a special presentation on the borough-based jails uh, project. Uh, the Department of Design and Construction and AECOM Hill Joint Venture 
are here to provide an update. I'll turn it over to that team. If you're speaking, we don't have. I um, just realized it. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so, sorry about that. Uh, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon. My, my name is Eduardo Del Valle, uh, and I'm the new DC, uh, DDC Associate Commissioner uh, leading the borough based GL program. Um, since uh, DDC's last presentation, Rebecca Clough had retired, she was leading the program. Uh, up until um, July. Uh, we wish her obviously all the best on the coast of Maine. Um, and so I am very pleased to be with you today um, to be bringing this critical project forward. As outlined in the agreement between DDC and the commission signed in 2019, our team is here today to present the Bronx facility. As you know, we have three other facilities in Manhattan, uh, Queens, uh, uh, and and um, uh, and um, and Brooklyn. Um, so we have been actively engaged with DCP staff since 2019, including receiving comments uh, on our RFP materials. Both staff and 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 commissioner uh, 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 and the commission played a critical role in getting us to where we are today. And we appreciate the opportunity to keep you updated on the progress of our work. Uh, with me today are Ron Vega. He's the senior DDC design executive for the Bronx facility. Uh, and Jackie uh, Horobas, AECOM Hill joint venture design lead for the Bronx facility, uh, who will also be presenting after uh, Ron. Joining us for the Q&A will be Beverly Pryor and Nina Glaston from AECOM Hill joint venture as well as Barbara Mikret and America Cañas from uh, Mark J, as well as Molly Bernstein and Ashley Smith from CHS. Um, next, next slide. So on today's agenda, we will um, uh, obviously, as I said before, discuss the Bronx facility. We will start the presentation by providing an update uh, overall update on the uh, overall program at this juncture and where we are. We'll then provide an update on the, more specifically on, on the Bronx facility, including the built context and indicative design development process, and some highlights on design guidelines that we've included in the upcoming RFP. Next slide, please. So starting with the program, next slide. Um, as by way of summary, and as a reminder to the commission, the, uh, the BBJ or borough-based jail program will replace, will replace the active jails at Rikers uh, with a smaller and more humane jail system that houses 3,300 people. The key components are that people in custody will be housed based on their borough of residence. People in custody programming will focus on re-entry and support and staff support will be enhanced to create better working environment. Next slide, please. The Bronx site program schedule, um, basically uh, at this point, we are uh, in entering uh, and about to release the RFP for the Bronx facility. Uh, at the end of September, we will, uh, we will uh, have our two shortlisted teams uh, compete. Um, and we plan to award a selected design builder and issue an NTP or a notice to proceed by the end of next year. Uh, facility at this point is scheduled to complete by 2027. In the meantime, we have design builders on board working on the Bronx site preparation project since, the, uh, since 2021, since last year. The purpose of this project is to prepare the site for future development of the new Bronx facility. The project requires construction of a temporary combined sewer, i.e. sanitary and storm, site clearing and remediation, excavation, and removal of previously demolished, of the previously demolished Lincoln Hospital substructure and superstructure. And all the buildings remain, all, all, the, build, all the building remains from early demo. 
as well as require support, maintenance, protection, and possible relocation of existing utilities and other related activities. The project will be completed in the middle of next year, meaning um, the early works project, just before the facility design builder begin, begins. Next slide. And at this point, I would like to uh, uh, hand it over to Ron Vega, who, as I said, is DDC's senior design executive for the Bronx facility for the next portion of the presentation. Ron? Thank you, Eduardo. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ron Vega. I'm an architect and I'm the design executive for the Bronx facility. And I'm happy to welcome you to the Bronx. I'm going to share with you the process for establishing and incorporating the design guidelines into the RFP. Next slide, please. We're going to start with the built context. I'm going to take you around the neighborhood, show you the community where our facility is going to be situated, and to indicate how hard we worked to include everyone in the process and to be as uh, open and uh, uh, reasonable and uh, listening to all the participants, sponsors, and the community themselves. Next slide, please. Here is our site. We're located at 745 East 141st Street. We're surrounded by, on four sites, we have uh, Concord Avenue to the west. We have uh, sort of a morphing avenue in Southern Boulevard, morphing into Bruckner on the east. To the north is East 142nd Street and to the south is 141st Street. Um, this site is uh, in a neighborhood in Mott Haven in the Bronx. From its dedication, this site in 1899 was the site of the original Lincoln Hospital. The old Lincoln Hospital sat there until its demolition until the mid 1970s. Until recently, actually just two months ago, the site was uh, where the New York City tow pound was. So it wasn't too happy a site to go to. Next slide, please. Looking at the site itself, and uh, these photographs show a little remnants of the tow pound while it was still there. You see on uh, East 141st Street, looking uh, down Concord Avenue, you have the existing three-story two-family residence on the left. And to the right, you see our facility, our site, what's outlined in red is where the future affordable housing facility will be. So when that uh, facility is open, this street will become a purely residential tree-lined street on its way up to, uh, to, my, to the, uh, the park, St. Mary's Park. And on the right, you see uh, the other corner of our site, which is 142nd Street. And what you see uh, to the right is our neighbor. Our neighbor is a uh, five-story walk-up with a first floor restaurant, the fabulous Don Pinchon restaurant I invite you to visit. And down the block, we have right behind our five-story, we have an empty lot and then a building which at present is being renovated and the landlord is hoping to pitch this as a charter school location. The next uh, building down the block is actually uh, extra space storage, which there are quite a few within the neighborhood. And those are our neighbors to the, to the north and to the uh, west. So next slide, please. Here we have a shot on the left showing how the congestion morphs and uh, merges as people are coming off uh, Southern and turning into Bruckner. When you're looking at this site, this corner right here will be the main entrance to our uh, uh, persons in custody facility. Uh, the center slide here shows our neighbors to the south. We have a, at present La Flor Express Moving Company. And to the right, we have a, bo uh, a steam boiler company. Uh, unfortunately, La Flor went out of business last month. It was a multi-generational business, uh, which was, will now be vacant and they're looking for people to buy. So we don't know what will be there when we open, but it's an industrial block and that's what's facing our building to the south. And on the right, we have the site as it presently sits. You'll see that we have uh, demolished as much as we could of the uh, police uh, facility. Trailers have been removed. We've kept the guard booth and uh, one of the trailers for our use, but you see the, uh, the dumpsters in place getting ready for the demolition process. Next slide. Some more shots of the, of the neighborhood. There's our steam boiler um, company that I said was on the uh, near one, near the Concord Avenue access point. And then across the street, we have our residences. 
And then uh, our neighbor to the east is uh, the Bruckner Boulevard itself, Bruckner Boulevard underpass and the highway itself. Next slide, please. Now that I've shown you the neighborhood, I wanna show you how hard we've worked to, to uh, be as transparent as possible with the community and with the sponsor agencies and uh, all our, uh, our uh, brother uh, agencies as well. Next slide. So going back to January of, 19, of 2020, uh, in the pictures to the right, you actually see uh, now former Assistant Commissioner, uh, Rebecca Clough uh, leading a meeting and uh, it's almost like a timestamp of our life nowadays. That was before COVID. Nobody had masks. Everyone was, was meeting face to face. And then you see the slide below, and it's almost like an episode of Hollywood Squares, where everyone is in their little cubby um, and waiting to be called upon. You can see by the list here that we have reached out to um, an amazing amount of different entities and uh, engaged them. And it hasn't all been rosy, but we've made our efforts to pitch the job, pitch what our intent is, pitch what our aim is, and uh, we've listened. We've listened to each and every one of these en uh, entities and they have uh, informed us and helped us to, to mold our facility into what we hope it'll be. Next slide, please. We also had a community outreach uh, event where we took into account all of the uh, community's concerns they wanted to make sure that the facility entry was uh, accessible and had an environmental component. They wanted to be recognizable, but not look like a typical government building. They wanted us to design a transparent and contemporary community and retail space that conveys openness and welcomes the community. They wanted a public lobby to maximize engagement and dialogue. They wanted uh, us to have group seating outside for gatherings. They wanted the sidewalk security that blends into the environment, including engineered planters that are aesthetically pleasing and include nature. You won't realize that we have a security ring around our building. It, it will be as uh, uh, invisible as possible. Uh, we're gonna offer a lot of lighting. We have a lot of ped lights. We're doing our best to make sure the sidewalk is completely lit. And we're gonna create a facade with layers and compartments that, uh, that make the building read more like the community. Next slide, please. So after all these uh, events, we actually had to sit down with justice, justice, justice advocates. And these are people that were uh, in, in mainly, mostly uh, formerly incarcerated and uh, they have a tremendous insight, uh, specifically on the interior spaces. And these are their bullets. And uh, I can tell you that we've complied with every one of their wants and needs and we've paid close attention to what they feel would make uh, their experience, a hopefully short-lived experience, a better experience coming to this facility. Next slide. We also met with our peer review committee. And these fine folks uh, gave us their opinions, gave us their insights. They're all experts in the field. And again, we also listened, we paid attention. We took their comments and morphed them into our uh, RFP. And they all live on uh, with what we present to the design builder. Next slide, please. These are some of the concepts that they came up with and they told us that it had to be important. Important to consider pedestrian traffic around the facility, including how pedestrians interact with staff vehicles entering and exiting the facility and the high traffic from Brookner Boulevard. They wanted us to treat the exterior walls and, and the building should not have an institutional look. They wanted us to consider the relationship between the facility and adjacent, adjacent affordable housing, which is the HPD housing. Uh, they wanted to create public areas in the lobby and uh, create the lobby that is welcoming, has restrooms, and that the restrooms should be close to another rather than next to the rooms, that, such as interview rooms. They wanted the design for admissions, transportation, and discharge to be, uh, well, they warned us that it was going to be a highly charged and emotional condition for the people that are coming into the facility, and they wanted us to try to use architecture to calm that, that experience down, and I know we have. And then we want to incorporate as much daylight as possible into the interior of the facility, which we have as well. Next slide. So these are the design guidelines that we're going to put into our RFP. And we, these are the primary sources, the Justice Implementation Task Force, the Van Allen Institute, Neighborhood Advisory Committees, Borough-Based Jails Master Plan, the ULERP requirements. We've got the sponsor agencies and other partner agencies. 
We've had everyone visit the site with the partner agencies and our stakeholders, yourself included, and the PDC staff, community design workshops, criminal justice advocate workshops, and design peer review. Next slide. And these are the concepts that we're gonna make part of our RFP, right? We're gonna have an executive summary with the scope of work, overarching core values, principles, and design guidance. We're gonna have a space list with narrative or required spaces and relationships and functional operational criteria. We're gonna have site and building criteria by design and engineering specialty. And then we're gonna have a detailed performance spec with room data sheets. And with all this put together, I now turn this presentation over to Jackie. Jackie uh, Hodobas, who is uh, the ACOM Hill lead designer, who will give you a little more details and uh, actually bring us home. Jackie, you're, here you go. Jackie, you need to turn your mic on. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Lovely. <laughs> I'm going to panic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ron. So, um, yes, as Ron noted, I'm the design lead for the Bronx facility. Uh, now that Ron's taken us through the community engagement process and RFP cooperation process, I will provide some highlights from the Bronx facility just uh, design guidance for you today. The so next slide, please. And uh, next one again, please. So the design guidance that we are including in the scoping documents for the design builders is aimed at achieving four overarching goals. These are supporting environments uh, that are normative and foster safety, autonomy and well-being, connected communities by facilitating connections to enhance the network of support to people in custody, civic assets, through exemplifying outstanding architecture that is well integrated within the fabric of the existing neighborhood. And finally, enduring resources by designing facilities that will perform optimally over, over and beyond the course of their life cycle. Next slide, please. These goals are related to the urban quality. The ideas and goals of the BBJ program is to design a building that does not have the appearance of a design facility, but has an urban presence that has both the civic and residential feel. Key to achieving this is the building facade and the building materials. The facade will be designed to minimize the interior operations visibility to the public. This means limiting black blank facades that are typical of detention facilities and by contrast of large transparent surfaces that improve access to daylight and at the same time give the appearance of a building that is more traditional of the Bronx area and not necessarily a functional detention facility. Materials will also be key to, to creating a non-institutional appearance and creating a more welcoming environment. Points of reference for both the facade and materials for the civic and residential buildings in the neighborhood. We are taking this approach as we want to make the building as sensitive to the surrounding environment and neighborhood as possible. At the ground floor, the design of the lighting solution will respond to the security requirements of this type of facility, but in a way that feels more commercial, feels more like a commercial or a residential building. Next slide, sorry. Thank you. Um, so massing and building form is also essential to a successful design. As noted by Ron earlier in the presentation, the goal will be to use massing to respond to the distinct scale and context of the facility surroundings. Uh, each site and each side of the site, including the Bruckner to the east and the affordable housing to the west. At the ground floor, the main entrance will be representative of the, of the civic nature of the building. This means a streetscape solution that creates accessibility, connections to the community, connections to public trans transit, and ultimately achieving a welcoming appearance to visitors and pedestrians. Uh, next slide, uh, slide please. 
In thinking about slash and access, they considered both pedestrian and vehicular experiences. For pedestrians, we aim to improve access through wayfinding solutions and streetscape elements that facilitate pedestrian circulations and lines of sight. In doing so, pedestrians will be able to easily navigate around the site to either the facility or to access community and retail spaces. It is also important to consider the design of the facility from all vantage points including streets such as Wales Avenue that dead ends at the facility, making the facility the view one sees at the end of a long corridor. Vehicular access will be in the private right-of-way, which will not be treated as a back-of-the-house access point, but will, but will be given the same level of attention and design as the front. There will be implemented solutions that limit the impact of vehicular traffic to the facility, to create a safe environment for vehicle and pedestrian access. Some typical examples of this include clearly articulated sidewalks around the building and clear sight lines for pedestrians when crossing the private right of way. Next slide, please. We are making a big effort to improve the pedestrian experience. Uh, this will be facilitated by the active frontage on 141st Street and Rockness Boulevard. These facades will be transparent and open to the public. There will also be open spaces at the visitor entry to create relief for pedestrian traffic and pedestrian circulation. The landscape design will be key to improve pedestrian experience that incorporate safety and blast protection requirements. Designing seating and furnishings around the facility that are in keeping with the surrounding neighborhood will help to minimize the impact of security features along the perimeter and encourage interactions and gatherings that are safe and comfortable. So with that, I'll hand you over to Eduardo to wrap things up. Thank you, Jackie. Um, so next steps, next slide. <laughs> um, Looking ahead, we're aiming to release the Bronx Facility RFP um, in this fall and begin the in-market period of the DB procurement process um, shortly thereafter. And, and, and we'll, we'll continue advancing the other facilities in um, uh, Queens, uh, Manhattan, and Brooklyn, uh, and maintain engagement, obviously, with both the commission and other community stakeholders. So um, with that, I'd like to uh, thank you. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions from, from the commissioner. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me kick it off and then I will turn to my colleagues. Um, first of all, let me uh, congratulate you on uh, the efforts made to uh, do a robust community engagement process to identify those components that would make uh, this facility uh, work and um, respect the various needs that were articulated. The things that, uh, that jumped out at me were not having an institutional look or public areas in the lobby, and, um, a design for admissions to calm down a charged atmosphere, or even minimizing visibility of sensitive activity while also creating an environment where for the public where it does not look like a, like a blank facade. So I think those are all very important. Um, uh, let me just ask one, you know, there was one slide which talked about um, a, a Sally Port Alley between buildings here, um, between the, uh, the, the facility, the, the jail facility and uh, future uh, building next door perhaps. Can you just explain a little bit uh, more about that and how that might be factored into the design here? Sure. Ron, Ron would you like to take that up? Sure. So the ULERP uh, approval asked us to create a right of way uh, that would be between our facility and the future HPD affordable housing. And uh, within our design, we decided that it would not be uh, a pleasing uh, experience for people living in the HPD housing to look down upon uh, DOC vans and trucks and buses coming in and discharging um, the persons in custody. So we determined that what we would do was create 
a sally port that's a covered walkway, a covered uh, driveway um, that uh, depending on the site, uh, this, the light design, uh, the sun study might have a green roof on top of it. So that when the HPD facility opens, uh, when they look down from their windows, all they would see would be a, a, uh, a green roof and they would not experience any of the uh, uh, offloading of the inmates, uh, wouldn't experience any of the garbage pickups, any of the uh, functioning portions of, uh, of the building and even the staff that are driving in and out of the underground parking garage would not be visible once they left the curb. Once they left the curb, they would disappear into this tunnel, so to speak, tun tunnel slash sally port uh, into the building itself. Uh, forgive me, the difference between a tunnel and a sally port, uh, I'm not sure I uh, could explain the distinction. Maybe you can help me understand. So the, the sally port in general is an open loading dock kind of construction. Basically, everything's open to an open driveway. And so uh, rather than create some kind of overlapping roof, we have to provide privacy. We have to provide security. And so there's going to be a, uh, a, um, a bearing wall uh, separating our facility from the future HPD facility, 23 feet tall. And so we have a wall on this. On, if you're entering the site off of 141st Street, you're going to have a wall on your left. You'll have a facility on your right. The first turn will open up to a driveway that takes you down to the underground parking. The next uh, garage door actually is a, is a uh, garage location for an ambulance. And then the next one is a double door, which allows us to take care of our, our compacted uh, garbage. And then we have the actual large port, which has the... Uh, the driveway and the, and the parking spots for three large uh, direction uh, correction buses to offload inmates into the building. So normally that would all be open. Normally it'd be like a downtown uh, industrial place and you walk down the street and you turn to the right and there's this big open loading dock. Here, we're actually creating a covered uh, driveway. So when you're actually on the site from the sidewalk, all you see is a, a garage door or in our case, we're actually having bifold doors. And then beyond that, you wouldn't know what was going on. And from above, you'd have a roofed covered uh, driveway. And so maybe tunnel's not the right word, but it, it's going to feel that way because as you're driving through, you have a cover, you have heavy construction on either side. And until you drive all the way through and exit onto 142nd Street. And the physical distance between, or I guess the size of this roof here is really the equivalent of the distance between one building and the next. Is that right? Um, yes, yes. I, it's going to be foreshortened a little bit because we don't, uh, we don't cover it for the first driveway, which where the, the cars will actually disappear under the building to go to the garage below. So that'll be open to the sky. But about 30 feet in is where you have the beginning of this covered roadway. Covered and how roadway. much space is there between these, the two? The actual width is 30 feet. Okay. And is that, uh, and in terms of design of the building itself, uh, the, the jail building itself is, uh, are there any design components that other than this that relate to the uh, future potential HPD site next door or? Oh yes, is, oh yes, yes. Tell us uh, about that. Yeah, we have, uh, we have dedicated uh, whatever faces or whatever will face the HPD building will have uh, green roofs. It'll actually step down from the highest point. It'll always be stepping away from the HPD facility. So as you go up, I mean, the first, uh, uh, we call it a podium. The first four stories will be general office space. But the, after the fourth floor is where we start to have our, uh, our cells. And those will step away from, uh, if you want to call it, they'll lean towards the Bruckner. I'll step away from the HPD houses so that every floor is further and further away in distance on a straight line to the HPD houses. And we're also looking at ways that we could uh, obscure the view, uh, redirect the view so that uh, our uh, residents will not be able to look out and look directly into the HPD housing apartments. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Let me go to uh, members of the commission. I'm going to start with the vice chairman, Mr. Knuckles. Thank you, chair. Uh Mr. Vega, two, uh, two questions. Uh, 
the HPD site, whatever's built on it, I assume that the front portion will be on Wales Avenue. Is that is that correct? Yes, correct. Uh, their their new neighbor will will face the uh, three story uh, two two family walk ups. They will actually be facing that, and and the height of the facility, although it hasn't been determined yet, will actually it's going to be definitely taller than eight stories. So there'll be no you won't have a, a point of view to see the jail behind it. It'll be so tall that from the street level, you will not notice the jail behind it. Okay. Uh, so from the rear yard uh, boundary of the HPD site and then the correctional facility site, is, uh, is there any space between or do they abut literally one another? No, no, not at all. The uh, It's been very carefully crafted so that uh, the HPD facility will have uh, the first story being uh, retail, so mm -hmm. that uh, you know it'll be probably bodegas and small retail spaces, which will be a wonderful treat for the neighbors on the Concord. And uh, so that, that that level will rise about two stories, and then it it's full full uh, distance because it's retail, so there's no real backyards there. Above that will rise the residences. So those will be at least 30 feet away from the property line. And then another 30 feet, which is our right of way. So 60 feet before we hit the office facility portion of our facility. And then above that, we step away another 20. Each time we step away, it's about 20 feet. So when you get to the top, we're, we're 100 feet away from the, from the HPD uh, window, so to speak. So is there a thoroughfare then, you know, running uh, along... Uh... You know, the, you mean like a service drive, a service drive or something like that? Yeah, they they're, they're talking about it. Um, yeah, they're very, very early on. You know, they're actually they're actually working with us. HPD is not going to get deep into the weeds until we get going mm -hmm. because we kind of need that spot for our lay down area for our facility. So they're not going to really get too deep into it. But they've let us know that one of the considerations they have is they're going to have a service drive because that whole first floor is going to be retail. And, uh, you know, they don't want to clog up uh, Concord Avenue with uh, deliveries. I see. Uh, secondly, and this goes back uh, several years uh, when the project was going through Euler, but I seem to recall that there was at least some consideration about uh, a community facility presence within. Uh, you have an excellent thing. memory. Excellent memory. Yes. Yes. Is that yeah, still we, on the table? Yeah, absolutely. 40,000 square feet. So pretty much the whole streetscape on 141st Street, it's going to be community facilities and retail. We're going to change the dynamic of that whole neighborhood. I mean, we're going to have the curb appeal, right? Of course, across the street, we have those industrial facilities. But on our side, it'll be tree-lined stores, benches. I mean, you really won't. I mean, the learned person will know there's a jail there. But if you're walking along the streetscape, you would have no idea that there's a jail that, that's within this facility. And none of these community spaces, none of these retail spaces connect in any way to the jail. So everything happens sort of like backstage from these facilities. So 50,000 square feet in total because we just got another 10,000 square feet. Uh, the parole board said they don't wanna put their court in our facility. And ULERP said the only alternate use would be facility for uh, for retail or community space. So while we started off with 40,000, we now have 50,000. That's that's a lot of square footage. And this would be community facility space that would be accessible by the- uh, Street, it could yeah. be a library or, or, or whatever, right? I mean, it would be accessible by community residents. Absolutely, it'll be a walk up in every case. Uh, we have a, a very odd site in that there's a lot of elevation changes. So some of them will be straight walk in, some of them will be steps with a ramp to get in, but every one of these entrances will be, uh, you know, very, very well, uh, in, very, very inviting, very well designed to, to bring the community alive. They kind of need this, they don't have anything there. And uh, we're gonna bring people to our facility, not just because, uh, you know, they've committed a crime. We're gonna bring them to our, our facility because they wanna go shopping. They wanna go to the big supermarket store there, or maybe the new, bodega they relocated across the street they're going to have a lot of opportunity and the residents that live on concord my goodness they've been looking at either a hospital or a parking garage tow pound for more than half a century now we're going to bring life back to it in fact by just closing down the tow pound 
we have made that community so much nicer. And, you know, instead of having a tow truck bringing cars 24 seven around, it's all quiet now. So just by the virtue of going forward and uh, doing the pre-work to site preparation, that neighborhood is so much better right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. And I will note uh, the, the folks in this facility um, um, uh, are accused of uh, doing a crime, not necessarily have uh, committed a crime. I will just make that subtle distinction there. My apologies. Um, they're, to, they're all innocent people. Correct. That, let, let me go to uh, Commissioner Marin. Thank you, Chair Garadnik. Um, most of the questions that I wanted to ask have been asked by Chair Knuckles, but I do want to touch on something that I, I think is a white elephant in the room that we're not talking about, which is the HPD property. And I know that this is a presentation from DDC. Um, number one, yes, the site has never looked more beautiful. It's clean, pristine, new corrugated metal fencing. It should have been that way when the topan was there, but it wasn't. It, it, it really looks really good now, and I can't wait to see what the new building will look like. But my question really is pointed towards the HPD development, which we, if, if my recollection serves me correctly, was supposed to be built before the jail. And it doesn't seem like it's going to now. I keep hearing future, and I hear staging area. Um, Mr. Vega alluded to a staging area that was required. Could someone elaborate on that, if at all possible? Yes, there are uh, points of agreement that are tied into our facility. And HPD is building another facility. Maybe that's what you're thinking about. Uh, let me look at the address on that. Yes, it's about two blocks away, 351 Powers Avenue. They're going straight ahead with that one. So that's the one that's going to open before our facility. It's only two blocks away if you look at a map. And, but 320 Concord, which is a, you know, the, the site, uh, HPD uh, neighbor to us, that's their intended address, 320 Concord, was always going to wait until we were a little bit further along. That was the agreement of the, and it was always in the points of agreement that they would wait until we were a little further along because that gives us the opportunity to uh, lay down our, uh, our, our steel or our, our construction equipment in that area for a small time and then move on. It doesn't mean that they're not going to issue RFPs. It doesn't mean that they're going to do the start design work, but they won't take possession until we can turn it over as we move along to our facility. Remember, we have to di dig up that area for a temporary sewer. And that's, that's a big deal. We're going to, have to be going down to basically reroute the sewer line and then that sign, that entire line will be abandoned so that we can connect to the new sewer, which is happening uh, on Bruckner Boulevard. So there's a little bit of a sidestep there. So that's another reason why we just couldn't um, give up that site so right, so quickly. It's, understandable. it's, under, it's understandable because you do. I, I see the work that's going on. I, I, I live what, maybe 15 blocks from this area, and I have to trace this area coming into the city every day. Um, so I do understand that, but I, I, I do recollect, and I'm not talking about the power side, and I'm not, I don't want to make this an argument point, but my, my recollection was that because the community was so incensed, specifically Community Board 1, that the commitment was to deliver the housing first. If that's not the case, and that's been discussed with the community, and they understand that, then there should be no problem. Yes, Thank you. it has been discussed with the community, yes. Uh, Taylor, would you like to chime in? Sure. Um, hi, Commissioner Marin. Hi. Commission uh, Taylor Wolfson with AECOM Hill. Just wanted to note, just to build on what Ron had said, um, we have been speaking with HPD um, and, and talking with them in order to figure out the best timing. HPD has informed us that they are gearing up to start their own process. They said that their process starts with community engagement followed by an RFP and then construction. And so um, they are continuing to update us on their progress and we are ensuring that um, our work accommodates them as needed. So they'll, their process will take some time in order to get to the construction component, but we're making sure that we are accommodating their work as needed once they start with their construction. Um, and just, I think Ron mentioned it as well, but our site preparation project does include excavation and all the work on the HPD component of the site. So we are also helping to get their portion of the site ready for their construction as well um, with our work. So it is in progress, just um, kind of in a slightly different way, maybe from you know how it would typically go. Un understood. I just I just know that there was a lot of contention around the jail and community board one to begin with in the community. 
and I just want to make sure that they are being informed and kept up to date of any changes that are happening so that we don't have an issue of, 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 of objection of what's going on. Definitely. We can pass this along to HPD um, since they have more information than we do, but we can make sure that they are aware as well of, of what your comments. Thank you, Taylor. I appreciate it. Thank you, Commissioner Marine. Commissioner Rampershat. Yes, uh, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Um, I, a lot of the questions I had uh, were already asked uh, by Vice Chair Knuckles, by Commissioner Marin, and as well as you, Chair. Um, I just really had one comment and just one additional question. I think what would be very helpful when given these presentations or updates is to actually show a site plan or a couple of renderings of what the, the facility looked like just there as a refresher, because it has been a while since we've all seen it. And it'll help definitely, from my, my perspective, understand the site a little bit better. One of the questions I had was based on the comments raised by the peer review, were there any design changes that have been made? And if so, is there something that you can share with us at the next briefing so we know? And has there been a change to the, both the timeline and to the budget of this project? So we, we've, uh, we received peer review comments and are currently in the process of evaluating those comments and finding that many of their comments and feedback um, happens to overlap with, with what we already are, are addressing in, in, our, in our design, our indicative design and, and, and RFP. Um, we will reconcile uh, whatever other comments they may have that we don't have, uh, but we'll we're now in the process of, of reconciling those comments. Um, and, and happy to find out that there's a lot of overlapping. Um, so as far as the schedule, at this point in time, the project uh, is unscheduled to still be delivered by, uh, by the summer of 2027. Um, and as I said before, the RFP will be issued in the fall uh, with, 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 the ultimate, with the ultimate goal of... Uh, Completing, completing construction by way of design build by, by summer of 2027. Thank you. Yep. Uh, and I'll just um, add something in. in uh, this is Beverly Pryor. Um, in term, this is a design build procurement, so there is no specific design yet. And you've heard us mention uh, at various times something that we're calling indicative design, which is something basically to test the site, test the Euler requirements, the floor area requirements, um, or sorry, the floor area ratio and all those different elements to um, establish something that helps the design, the proposers to um, uh, understand what uh, the city is envisioning, but that, that's not the design. And that's something that will be uh, coming forward at a, a future point once we have a selected proposer. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Osorio. Thank you so much for the presentation. I, I appreciate the, um, the context that you provide in terms of how the site uh, relates to this larger uh, set of goals. I know that this is a community that has been very interested in um, increasing, injecting sustainability in Rikers um, overall. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about the, the environmental performance that is expected at the site, um, particularly in terms of uh, whether there are, there's been any discussions or the, during the public participation, there were any comments about in including uh, renewable energy resources or infrastructure as part of the design. Um, as well as uh, whether the type of landscaping uh, interventions that you described include any type of ecological services to the community, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, green infrastructure, et cetera. That's, that's the first question. And the second question is whether you can expand a little bit about the, per, the percentage or the proportion of um, community facility versus retail that you're expecting will happen in that first floor. Thanks. So, so in accordance in accordance with local law requirements, um, we we are um, uh, including in the RFP the the the, the, the requirement for the building to be a gold lead certified um, and comply with the other applicable local law uh, uh, sustainability uh, uh, and and. Uh, 
uh, green design requirements, um, not only design, but also construction wise, uh, minimizing waste um, and uh, during construction and, and uh, um, minimizing the, the, the amount of emissions during construction as well. Um, so, um, Nina, would you like to add anything? Sure. Hi, this is Nina Gladstone, and I am uh, the overall design lead for the project management consultant on Acon Hill. So the building is expected to be lead gold. That is a requirement um, to the design builders to achieve lead gold. Um, some of the things that they're being asked um, to ensure is that this building is highly energy efficient. Um, that the, um, you know, the water use is greatly reduced from what would be in a standard you know, uh, jail building, um, looking at the site and ways of containing water on the site. Um, so there are all kinds of um, requirements that we've put into the design guidelines and the RFP for the design builder on making this the most energy efficient, um, sustainable building. Um, I also uh, wanted to mention that the breakdown of the retail and the community space at this point hasn't been determined. I think that's something that, you know, will come out of a variety of community meetings. Um, it's not really up to this team, but um, will be determined at a future date. Right now, it's being um, left as an open shell space white box. Um, for the community to be able to use and, and depending on the needs of the community for that space. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner, did, did you have uh, any other questions? No, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, okay, any other questions from the, uh, from the panel here? Okay, seeing none, thank you all very much for uh, your presence here today and for sharing uh, uh, the component parts that will be going into the, uh, the RFP. We wish you the best and we'll look forward to, um, uh, to revisiting uh, down the line. So thank you. Uh, thank and you. I'm now gonna turn back to Ryan Singer uh, to move us forward to the next item of the agenda, which is another special presentation. That's right. Uh, so a special presentation uh, this time by Kate Lemos mchale uh, of the Landmarks Preservation Commission on two historic districts in Cambria Heights. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Good. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Garodnik and Commissioners. I am Kate Lemus McHale, Director of Research for the Landmarks Preservation Commission. I'm joined by my colleagues Timothy Fry and Sonia Gior today, and I'm delighted to present. Uh, these two historic districts, the Cambria Heights 222nd Street and the Cambria Heights 227th Street historic districts, which were designated on June 28, 2022. Uh, both were built in 1931. They comprise two remarkably cohesive and intact groups of storybook style row houses in the Cambria Heights neighborhood of Queens. Uh, next slide, please. The Cambria Heights 222nd Street Historic District contains 46 row houses between 115th Road and 116th Avenue. It was developed by a company called Selective Homes Incorporated um, and designed by the Queens architectural firm of Monda and Bertolazzi. Next, please. And five blocks away, the Cambria Heights 227th Street Historic District contains 50 houses between 116th Avenue and Linden Boulevard. It was developed by the Queens firm Wallaceoff Brothers. Next, please. Uh, these districts are both architecturally distinctive and they fit within LPC's equity framework as we seek to increase designations uh, in communities not well represented by landmarks and to better tell the story of all New Yorkers. A predominantly African-American and Afro-Caribbean community, Cambria Heights has no designated landmarks or historic districts. These blocks were identified um, as part of a large survey conducted in 2019 to look at Queens row house developments of the 20s and 30s, many of which were designed in the Tudor revival style. 
to better understand what makes some developments uh, stand out as more meritorious architecturally. Uh, due to the creative application of the storybook style, which I'll describe in a, in a bit, um, these blocks really stood out in comparison to other examples of this type of development in Queens and also within their neighborhood. Um, the surrounding blocks do not share their architectural distinctiveness, integrity, or the strong sense of place that these two districts have. Um, in public testimony, LPC received support for designation for both districts from council member Danique Miller, the New York Landmarks Conservancy, the Four Borough Neighborhood Preservation Alliance and individual property owners. Um, we had support from four owners on 227th Street and three on 222nd Street. Two residents of the 227th Street um, uh, opposed designation, and at the public hearing, two people raised questions about designation and regulation. Uh, next, please. During the course of these designations, and because we did you know, hear more questions at our public hearing, LPC staff did a great deal of outreach here with property owners. We had conversations before calendaring, we held meetings um, in Zoom virtually, and then after the public hearing, we had our first um, in-person meeting here, pictured was in a community garden just outside the 227th Street District. Um, we also had open office hours with staff and spoke to people individually. Um, and an interesting thing we did here, um, because of the architecture of this district, we did have questions about stained glass windows and we partnered with the Landmarks Conservancy to offer a workshop for homeowners about repair methods and resources. Uh, next slide, please. Located in southeastern Queens, the Cambria Heights neighborhood is on the border of Nassau County. And as you can see in this 1924 image remained mostly farmland into the 20th century. Um, until the 1890s, it was uh, part of Jamaica and then was described as part of St. Albans or Springfield until the 1917 purchase of 80 acres of farmland by Pennsylvania's Cambria Title Savings and Trust Company. Next, please. As infrastructure investment shifted away from railroads toward highways in the late 1920s, Robert Moses's extensive Long Island Parkway network, including the Southern State Parkway, um, which leads east from Cambria Heights, began to take shape. By 1930, work had begun on the Triborough Bridge um, and on a new park parkway network um, shown here and known as considered part of the proposed metropolitan loop. Um, despite the depression, thousands of homes were under construction um, in Queens as development really started to move outward in the borough. A developer at the time noted that this growth was simply an expression on the part of the people of New York City, that they still love trees and lawns and sunshine. Uh, next slide, please. The Tudor revival style, which began to appear in row house design by the early 1910s in Queens and Brooklyn, and you can see here the Chester Court Historic District is in that style, um, was often a style of choice in these growing suburban neighborhoods. Um, on 222nd and 227th streets, the architects incorporated elements of the Tudor revival style with what has come to be known as the storybook style. Originating in California primarily in the 1920s, the style took root after the Tudor revival, merged similar medieval precedents with fairy tale illustrations and the aesthetic of Hollywood, and, and overall added a lot more sort of exaggeration um, and, and a whimsical nature to the design with, with a mixture of materials sort of indicating um, great age and, and a more sort of playful use of ornament. Um, next, please. Both historic districts feature distinctive rows of expressive facades designed in the storybook style. On 227th Street, um, some of the features um, indicative of the style include the more vertically stretched entrance vestibules with flared eaves, the half timbering, diamond paned windows, stucco fields with randomly laid brick and stone accents, and the multicolored slate shingles, which actually have a sort of a ragged edge to indicate um, 
an age, a great age. Um, and storybook features of the 222nd Street houses include their Tudor arch window openings, brightly colored terracotta roofs and, um, and, and the multicolored windows, brick facades with random stone accents and their whimsically decorated chimneys. Um, next, please. In planning the two historic districts, builders adapted a model first widely used in Jackson Heights in the 1920s. Driveways behind the houses provide access to rear garages, which relegate the automobiles to the interior of the block and allowed for the continuous landscaped lawns, um, which add to the character and special sense of place of both districts. Uh, both developments were started in the spring of 1931 and began selling by the fall, marketed along with other developments nearby as Parkway Homes of St. Albans. Uh, 227th Street was also promoted individually, um, and advertisements noted the houses, eight rooms, brick construction, and their location on the gateway to the Southern State Parkway. Uh, next, please. Initially, residents of both the 222nd and 227th Street districts were white middle-class families. Black families began moving to Cambria Heights by the 1950s, often overcoming opposition, even overt hostility from some white residents and real estate brokers. By the 1980s, they were joined by immigrant families from Caribbean countries such as Jamaica, Haiti, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and Barbados. Today, Cambria Heights remains one of several prosperous, predominantly Black residential communities in southeastern Queens. Uh, next, please. Just a few analysis slides um, showing the districts and their architecture. The 222nd Street District is remarkably co cohesive with all buildings constructed in 1931 in the storybook style, all very high integrity um, with in intact historic features. And in both of these districts, the buildings are arranged um, in such a, in a pattern that, that essentially mirrors each other across the street. So you see variety along the block, but also um, some, re some repetition of specific types of houses. Uh, next, please. Uh, and most gardens do remain intact on 222nd. We do see some um, fences that have been built over the years like these, but they remain very transparent. And so they don't interrupt really the feel of that continuous um, front garden. Um, and also this slide just shows some of the whimsical um, chimney designs. And, and here on the street, no two of those are, are alike. Uh, next, please. And then on 222nd Street, also very cohesive and intact, um, also built in 1931 in the storybook style. Here, the mirrored pattern of facades is even more consistent, um, as are the uninterrupted front lawns. Uh, next, please. And so to conclude with our fanciful storybook designs, these well-preserved historic blocks are among the architectural highlights of Cambria Heights um, and Southeastern Queens. The property owners have been excellent stewards of these historic buildings uh, and LPC is pleased to add the Cambria Heights 222nd Street and 227th Street historic districts to the city's significant collection of designated places. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, but let me just kick it off. The, the, those two slides that you showed us of 222nd Street and 227th Street with the, um, uh, the consistency on style uh, and intactness um, and your notation that they were truly cohesive and intact. That felt like, a, if, if I'm reading that correctly, that felt um, impressively <laughs> cohesive and intact, unless I'm missing something. I've seen these maps over the years. That to me looked like, um, were there any were, were there any gaps? I mean, it looked to me like it was a straight cop. Each, of, each one of those three slides on each of those two pages to me looked like they were very close to the same, which suggests a very high level of cohesion if I'm understanding it correctly. Um, what am I, am I missing anything or is it really just that intact? No, it really is. It, it really was was a standout. Um, and I think the way that they were able to 
kind of include facades that have a slight variety in terms of maybe the shape of the entrance vestibule or the treatment of the chimney, but then overall along the block, it just is this incredibly strong sense of place and the, the buildings are very intact, um, the same height, and you get the kind of rhythm of sort of playfulness at the roof line of the various projecting elements. Um, but that combines so the quality of the architecture with the intactness of the yards too really did make Make these blocks stand out. And the approximate, and forgive me if uh, I missed this in your in your presentation, the the ages of these buildings, the, are they roughly contemporaries with one another? I know you had 1931 as a, a marker there, but what, what is the what is the age of this group of buildings? Yes, they were they actually both blocks were developed in 1931. Entirely in 1931. And From, yes, yeah, yep. And they were developed as a, as a group or were they, they were developed all at once or were they developed um, by a single owner? Like how, how, did it, how did it all happen? They were developed each by a separate developer um, who did each block as a kind of a single entity to then start selling the homes individually. Um, so they were two separate developers. Um, the, on 227 Street, it was the, a group called the Wallaceoff Brothers, and that was intended to be part of a much bigger development that didn't happen. Um, so this is really what was built. And, and the, the total number of buildings that would be included in these two districts? Uh, there are 50 houses in the 227th and 46, I believe, in 222nd. And there's okay, some, great. yeah. Go ahead. What, what were you going to say? Oh, Sorry. then in, in addition, some outbuildings, garages in the rear. Okay. Got it. Okay. Uh, let me go to Commissioner Bozarg. Hi, thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. This is very interesting. Um, you mentioned the equity framework that the LPC has developed. I think that'd be really great um, to share at some point for us to get an overview of that, especially with newer members here. Um, oh, great. Of course. Um, just to get a little bit more background on it. Um, so I know there's several different equity issues at play when it comes to landmarking. Um, from a housing perspective, at least, there's, you know, whose history is preserved where is housing, new housing, more, rest more restricted um, over time. And then there's kind of the cost burdens of preservation. I was just kind of curious in your engagement with, with communities here, whether you heard any concerns around the added cost burdens that this may present for families um, or homeowners um, in the process. And if LPC has tools or, or thinks about kind of assistance to, to uh, homeowners in that process. Sure, yeah, thank you. And I would be happy to talk more about the equity framework. Um, in terms of, of this neighborhood, we, we did have concerns about the process of regulation, what additional costs may be. And, and we, um, we really tried to make um, cl very clear to people that a lot of the type of changes that would happen here um, would be reviewed by our staff who have a lot of expertise and who work with individual property owners all the time. And there is a lot of guidance that we can provide to help people minimize the amount of time needed in terms of getting us a complete application. Um, and there are ways, you know, a lot of types of materials that can be used in substitution, et cetera, and how to work with windows. Um, and, and so that was one of the reasons we wanted to have that stained glass window workshop was to kind of give people a sense of, of approaches that might be possible there as well. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. I was also just curious if that was an issue that came up from, from um, homeowners in the area or, or if it's just more of a general issue you've heard about. Of, of cost or of stained glass windows? Just the cost and, and the um, kind of what it would mean for them from a regulatory right, perspective. Right, right. Yeah. That is, a, I mean, that is usually people's concern is, is how much time and money will this add to my process? So we try to really make sure people understand how best to get a complete application into the LPC and the ways that we can guide them through that. And, and we do try to get people what they want to do. We, we try to really be service-based and get to yes with homeowners and property owners. Thank you, okay, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Gold. 
Hi, and thank you so much for the presentation. It actually is a really beautiful uh, neighborhood, and it's interesting to see uh, the chair's point that so many of these homes um, have stayed intact. Um, but just really following up on Commissioner Bozog's question, the opposition that you got from the neighborhood, which it sounded like there, there was just two, um, was, was the genesis, well, well, two questions. One, do we think that the proper outreach was done there or sufficient outreach was done um, where, or, or, you know, where, where there really is just, you know, two folks um, who are opposing, or do we think um, that um, it may be more about the neighborhood knowing, because I guess to, to the, the other commissioner's earlier question, um, one would think that there'd be some um, uncertainty, let's say, on, you know, it sounds like it's a middle class neighborhood on, on, on those additional costs um, that we'd be implementing. So just curious there if, if we think there's enough outreach and two, if those two who opposed, um, it, was it a cost, was it a function of cost or was it something else? Sure. Yeah, I think, you know, this is an area where we don't have designations yet. So the people who live there aren't really familiar with it, what it means, you know, the benefits of kind of the recognition and the civic pride. Um, and, and so most of the people we talked to really were supportive of that, very happy to recognize the homes and how beautifully they've been kept up and also the history of this community. But we did get questions from people and it was mostly about cost, not understanding what it might entail. So we try to talk to people, you know, you can choose your own architects, you can choose your own contractors, anything that goes to the Department of Buildings, you're using the same drawings kind of thing. So just to help people understand our process. Um, and so I think the questions that were raised at the hearing let us know we needed to do more outreach. And so that's why we did do a lot more. And we, we had a good out you know, attendance when we met out um, in that public garden, and then people also followed up and asked us questions individually, et cetera. Got it. Perfect. And then one other question, um, probably, I'm not sure um, if you would know, but are there programs um, that LPC has access to uh, that can help the community, uh, the, the residents, if, you know, those costs tend turn out to be a burden? Are there programs that we can point them to that, that may support some of those costs for maintaining? Yes, um, we have a, well, we have a small grant program um, that is funds individual property owners, homeowners, or not-for-profits who own their buildings. Um, and so we work with people on that. It is um, income level based because they're it's federal funding mm -hmm. um and so i'm not sure here if everybody f falls within that but but we do try to make sure people are aware of it and 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 work with people to apply for it um, the landmarks conservancy also has a great low interest loan um, so it was nice to to really team with them here too and make sure that the people understood what they had to offer. Um, and then there are also tax credits and, and other sort of funding sources that being designated um, can help open up, so. Got it, perfect. Thank you and thanks for the education. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. Vice Chair Knuckles. Uh, no, I just uh, had the observation. I know this area very, very well and um, Within Southeast Queens, where there are lots of distinctive neighborhoods, I think these uh, particular areas are among the most distinctive. And I think uh, their uh, designation is altogether appropriate. I, I, I'm just wondering why it took so long. But uh, <laughs> I know it's complicated and I know people have trepidation about, uh, you know, if I change the doorknob, is it going to cost me uh, an exorbitant amount of money? Uh, so we understand those concerns. but. Uh, I think the uh, designation nonetheless is, is uh, very, very appropriate. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, and with that, um, that's all we got for you today. So we thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate your, uh, uh, your being here and for uh, uh, sharing these details with us. And um, we, will, uh, we will look forward to seeing you before long. Great, uh, thank you. Thank, thanks, thanks for coming. Ryan, let's go to the next item. Sure, so the first two items on our agenda are pre-hearing reviews of the two historic district designations that we just discussed. These are in Queens Community District 13 
And uh, here for her first presentation of the commission is uh, Shrista Vajrachara Shaka. Shrista? Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a pre-hearing presentation for two applications from the Landmarks Preservation Commission to designate portions of the Cambria Heights neighborhood as the 222nd and 227th Streets Historic Districts in Queens Community District 13. Next slide, please. The 222nd Street Historic District outlined here in yellow and composes the majority of a single city block bounded by 115th Road to the north and 116th Avenue to the south. The 227th Street Historic District outlined here in pink is located approximately five blocks to the east of the 222nd Street District. This district also encompasses the majority of a single city block and is bound by 116th Avenue to the north and Linden Boulevard to the south. The Cross Island Expressway, which also serves as Queen's border with Nassau County, is located approximately seven blocks east of the 227th Street Historic District. The historic districts are served by several bus lines. The Q27th route with a stop six blocks west of the 222nd Street District runs along Springfield Boulevard and serves downtown Flushing. The X64 and Q4 routes with stops two blocks south of the 222nd Street District and one block south from the 227th Street District runs along Linden Boulevard and serves Midtown Manhattan and downtown Jamaica respectively. Next slide, please. The area surrounding both historic districts is predominantly developed with one and two family residential buildings colored in light yellow on the map. Additionally, there are a few schools and houses of worship nearby colored in blue on the map. The East Springfield playground colored in green on the map is located three blocks west of the 222nd Street District. Linden Boulevard, located two blocks south of the 222nd Street District and immediately to the south of the 227th Street District, serves as one of the neighborhood's primary commercial corridors. The corridor is lined with commercial and mixed-use buildings, colored in red and orange, respectively, containing ground floor retail such as restaurants, pharmacies, salons, and supermarkets. Both historic districts are located within an R2A contextual district, which permits single family detached residential uses on two to three story buildings. R2A districts permit floor area ratios of up to 0.5 with maximum building heights of 35 feet. R2A districts are exclusive to Queens and are mapped in portions of Cambria Heights, Bayside and Whitestone. Next slide, please. Collectively, the two districts have a remarkably cohesive and distinctive group of row houses built in the storybook style. These houses remain exceptionally well-preserved more than 90 years after their completion in 1931. The Department of City Planning staff is unaware of any conflict with the zoning resolution, projected public improvements, or any plans for development, growth, improvement, or renewal in the area involved. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Shristi. Excellent job. Welcome, uh, and um, let me uh, let me see. We obviously just posed a fair number of questions to the Landmarks Commission directly. I don't know if there'll be any for you here, but let us see. Okay, as uh, perhaps expected, uh, um, thank you for your uh, for your presentation, and uh, again, great job. And uh, we will send this off to a public hearing on Wednesday. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you for that. And let's move on to our next next um, item for a pre-public hearing review. Ryan, go ahead. Sure, the third item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review of a zoning map and zoning text amendments and special permit permits in uh, Queens Community District 1. And our presenter is Joy Razor. Um, Joy? Thank you, Ryan. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Next slide, please. Since we have a few new commissioners joining us, I'll be providing a full background on the project. Um, and starting from the top, 
This is a private application for a rezoning and additional actions affecting an area located in Astoria, Queens, Community District 1. The project area encompasses five blocks bounded by 35th Avenue, 43rd Street, Northern Boulevard, 36th Avenue, and 37th Street. The applicant partnership includes Kaufman Astoria Studios, Bedrock Real Estate Partners, and Silverstein Properties. Together, the team proposes a mixed-use development totaling approximately 2.7 million square feet, including more than 2,800 residential units, over 700 which would be affordable, nearly 200,000 square feet of commercial development, an additional 230,000 square feet of office space, and more than two acres of public open space. The total lot area within the project area is also roughly half a million square feet and includes lots that are not owned by the applicant team. Next slide. The project area is located in Southern Astoria and the majority of the area is located within an M11 zoning district that was established with the adoption of the zoning resolution in 1961. A portion of the project area, which fronts on Steinway Street, was rezoned in 1998 to a C42A district to support the commercial corridor. To the immediate north, the portion of Astoria is primarily zoned R5 with east-west commercial corridors in R6 contextual districts with commercial overlays and the project area is also proximate to the Long Island City Special District to the southwest. Next slide. While this application is not subject to Local Law 78, which went into effect on June 1st, a few months after the project certified. Due to the scale of the project, the applicant team submitted a voluntary racial equity report on housing and opportunity. This also came at the request of the community board. The applicant states that the proposal would produce new income restricted housing units in a location that has a higher annual median income compared to the citywide average and is also highly accessible to transit and jobs. The median household income for Astoria is roughly $70,000 annually. And the, within the uh, Astoria neighborhood tabulation area, the demographics are 25% Hispanic, 49% white, 3% black, 17% Asian, and 4.5% two or more races. Median household income for Ravenswood, which is located a few blocks to the west, is about $41,000 annually. Next slide. Here's a closer look at the project area and the surrounding context. Immediately southwest of the project area is an industrial business zone, which is the purple area on the map. Beyond that to the southwest is the Dutch Kills special, special subdistrict shown in blue and the Queens Plaza special subdistrict shown in red. All of these front on Northern Boulevard, which is a 100 foot wide major Queens thoroughfare that acts as the project area's Northwestern boundary. South of Northern Boulevard is Sunnyside Yards for which a master plan was released in 2020. West of Steinway Street is the Kaufman Astoria Arts District, which is the black dotted outline, a collaboration of local organizations involved in the creative arts that anchor the area as a cultural destination and a center for the creative industries. And that's led by Kaufman Astoria Studios, who is an applicant partner in this proposal. Next slide. The neighborhood context land, uh, land use map shows the very wide variety of uses located in the immediately surrounding area, from lower density residential uses to the north and commercial corridors along 35th and 36th avenues, along with the mixed use character of the neighborhood to the south, which includes warehousing, light industrial space, commercial, automotive, and residential uses. The specific uses in the area include along 35th Avenue, PS 166, Henry Gradstein, which serves pre-K through fifth grade, Frank Sinatra School of the Arts High School, the Kaufman Astoria Studios, and the Museum of the Moving Image. Along Northern Boulevard, you can see the Food Bazaar and Wind Depot, which are both larger retail footprint stores with ample parking. And on 4401 Northern Boulevard, that's a site that was recently rezoned to R7X with a commercial overlay that Silverstein Properties, another member of the applicant team, intends to develop. United Artist Cinema, PC Richards uh, Appliance Store, the Parks Department Playground 35, and Harley Davidson are also within the project area. Next slide, please. 
As this slide more clearly shows, the project area is again located predominantly within an M11 district on either side of Steinway Street, and Steinway is mapped with a C42A district. M11 districts facilitate low density light industrial uses and some commercial uses. C42A districts facilitate mid density commercial and residential uses, and the R5 district immediately north and R6B district north of that facilitate mid-density residential uses typical of east-west commercial streets in Astoria with commercial overlays. West and southeast of the project area are M15 districts, which facilitate higher density uh, light industrial uses. Next slide. The project area consists of the entirety of five blocks, including um, 641, 668, 669, 670, and 671. And the yellow line is the development site, the blue outline is the uh, overall project area. Block 641 is primarily occupied by the large two-story United Artist Cinema with rooftop parking. And the 36th Street or 36th Avenue frontage of the block is occupied by two low-rise residential buildings and two commercial buildings. Block 668 is occupied primarily by PC Richard and Sons appliance store with a large accrade parking area. The southern half of the block along 38th Street contains parking and several two and three story townhouses. Along Steinway Street frontage, the southern portion of the block contains a few four story walk up apartment buildings containing 20 dwelling units each. And lot 36 also contains ground floor commercial uses. At the southeastern end of the block, um, at the intersection of Steinway Street and 36th Avenue, there's a two-story retail building, as well as uh, residential units above ground floor commercial. Block 669 contains Playground 35, a city park that features playground equipment, including swings, picnic tables, and benches, and primarily serves children and families who live in the area. The remainder of the block includes part of the former Queensboro Farms Dairy, which was a, a, mixed, a mix of low-rise manufacturing and automotive uses, a one-story billiard club that occupies the through block area and several one-story buildings with warehouse and auto repair facilities. Block 670 contains a two-story warehouse operated by Queensboro Farms Dairy, which takes up the northern end of the block, while the remainder contains one-story warehouses and auto repair facilities. Block 671 contains primarily one-story auto showrooms and dealerships, along with more re uh, repair facilities, and it should be noted that approximately 30% of the project area, as you can see, is not applicant owned, and the development site would comprise 21 lots within the five blocks. And for reference, these blocks will be labeled A through E throughout the presentation. Each development site fronts on the south side of 35th Avenue and extends to varying depths southward across each block. Next slide. Steinway Street, which runs through the middle of the project area, is the area's major commercial corridor. The streets east and west of Steinway Street within and adjacent to the project area are narrow one-way streets. 35th Avenue and 36th Avenues are wide two-way streets carrying traffic east and west to and from Northern Boulevard, which again is a major thoroughfare in Queens. In addition to subway transit access, there are four bus lines serving the immediate area and multiple city bike stations in the immediate vicinity. Uh, next slide, please. And now we'll take a short walking tour of the project area, beginning with Block A. This image shows the United Artists Cinemas, and the commission will note the blank walls with no entries or facade articulation, which creates an uninviting pedestrian experience. The cinema would remain within the project area, but would be relocated to a new building on Block D. Next slide. On Block B, you can see the main entrance to the PC Richard & Son appliance store and the large parking lot. Next slide. On Block C, this image shows the recently renovated Playground 35, which is owned and maintained by the Parks Department. Behind the existing play area, there's a brown perforated wall along the southern and eastern sides of the uh, playground in this image. And the applicant team is working with the Parks Department to improve this condition and replace portions of the wall as a function of the application. Next slide. 
On block D, you get a better sense of the existing industrial and automotive character of the project area. And next slide. And on block E, you can see um, more automotive uses that are characteristic of the area. Next slide. Here's a view of the surrounding area looking northeast along 41st Street. This is away from the project area. This image shows the residential character that the three and four story walk-up buildings south of 35th Avenue uh, are directly across from the project area. Next slide. As mentioned, the project area is located along Steinway Street, the area's major commercial corridor, and Northern Boulevard, one of the borough's major thoroughfares. Next slide. Both of the streets are wide streets that can uh, accommodate additional density. And according to the applicant team, the land use rationale for the proposed development is to align with the opportunities that the convergence of these corridors, transit options, and surrounding districts and uses provide to facilitate a mixed use development and bolster services to a local and area-wide population while bringing new economic development and housing opportunities. 35th Avenue, shown here, um, is a community-serving commercial corridor along the northern boulevard at the northern border of the project area. Steinway Street cuts north-south through the project area and contains the Steinway Astoria Partnership, the Business Improvement District, which is comprised of more than 300 businesses, including retail, eating and drinking, and food stores. Historically, the Steinway Commercial Corridor was comprised of primarily dry goods retailers and has struggled in certain locations to evolve into, um, into an identity that serves the shopping habits of the current consumer. Northern Boulevard in red serves a larger area and is defined, as we saw in the previous slides, by automotive, commercial, and larger retail uses. Next slide. This is a partial massing of the ground floor uses and the view has shifted south to show the project area from 35th Avenue. According to the applicant team, the intention is to complement the mission of the Kaufman Arts District and anchor the neighborhood context by creating a series of arts and cultural venues, including a multi-purpose arts and culture center, a re-envisioned multiplex movie theater, galleries, artist workshops, and tech and general office space. The project would also include eating and drinking establishments, a grocery store, and other local retail, service, and community facility uses. To support the new uh, residential population, the existing businesses, and residential community, this would all be anchored along Steinway Street and the 35th Avenue commercial corridors. Shown in red, the commercial, uh, the commercial uses would generally frame 35th Avenue and Steinway, and moving south across the blocks, the ground floor uses would comprise community facility uses and residential entries and lobbies. Next slide. The applicant team is also proposing a community innovation hub at the center of the project area, which would provide a number of services and would be occupied by community partners, such as the LGBT network, resettlement, and the Queens Public Library. You can see gallery spaces positioned along 37th Street, which would be occupied by the nearby Museum of the Moving Image to allow them to expand their programming. A series of eight public open spaces would also link the blocks, and amenities would include public seating, multi-purpose lawns, water features, landscaped areas, planters, shade trees, and a dog park, as well as an immersive playscape for children, open markets, kiosks, public art installations, sculptures, and enhanced streetscapes. In total, there would be more than two acres of public open space. There would be no mid-block crossings, but the open spaces are meant to be visually accessible across five blocks. The open space on block D would be open at the ground level and covered by the second story of the cinema. Next slide. Here's a site plan of the project area, and this view has shifted, so it's now facing northwest with the proposed building footprints indicated per block. There would be 13 buildings in total, three on block A, two on blocks B and C, three on D and three on E. The intention is for the buildings to frame the proposed open spaces on each block, which we saw in the previous diagrams. Next slide. Here's the site plan again, overlaid with the ground floor uses. The red indicates the retail spaces and red arrows show where the commercial entrances would be located many of which are located along the proposed open spaces. 
The yellow spaces further south in the project area are the residential lobbies that would be accessible via the access points in yellow. Community facility uses in blue would be positioned at the mid blocks and would be accessible via proposed open spaces and side street entrances. And parking entrances are shown in gray. Next slide. For additional clarity, this map highlights all of the proposed open spaces within the project area, which provide active and passive recreation and sight lines through the mid blocks of the development site. Next slide. This massing shows the project area facing southeast with Block A and 35th Avenue in the foreground. Non-residential buildings and building segments would be located across the development site and provide for the ground floor anchoring uses previously discussed, as well as a 10-story office tower located at the northwest portion of the development site on Block A, shown in purple, a community hub fronting on the large open space proposed for Block C, shown in blue, the cinema in red on block D, and office building bases along Northern Boulevard, also shown in purple. Above ground floor and base uses would be residential uses on each of the five blocks located in buildings ranging from nine stories on block A to 27 stories on blocks C and D. The proposed program would include more than 2,100 units of market rate housing and more than 700 units of affordable housing pursuant to MIH. Nearly 200,000 square feet of commercial space, including the 60,000 square foot cinema, an additional 230,000 square feet of office space, and more than 100,000 square feet of community facility space, including 60,000 square feet of the community hub on block C. Parking is proposed on the cellar level of each block for a total of 1,390 spaces. Next slide. Looking at the same diagram, now from Northern Boulevard and Block E, we can see more clearly here the context along 36th Avenue and Northern Boulevard with the office and residential towers on Blocks D and E. Next slide. To facilitate the development, the applicant team proposes a series of actions. Uh, the applicant proposes three zoning text amendments, the first of which would create a special mixed use district, which would allow for a range of residential, retail, office, commercial, and light industrial uses. The second would amend Appendix F and map MIH option one over the area. And the third would modify loading berths within the mixed use district. The applicant proposes to rezone the project area with four paired manufacturing and residential districts. And this would go hand in hand with the text amendment to create the special MX24 district that would facilitate this pairing. On the development site, the applicant seeks a series of special permits pursuant to a large scale general development to modify bulk regulations, accessory signage regulations, redistribute accessory parking across the project area and modify loading berth requirements. To establish a large scale general development, the development site must be located in a commercial or manufacturing district and be a minimum of 1.5 acres. And to grant large scale special, large scale general development special permits, the CPC must find that primarily the redistribution of floor area and other conditions must result in a superior site plan and the relationship between the development site and neighborhood context. In addition, the applicant also seeks a special permit to allow for retail uses greater than 10,000 square feet. Next slide. Here's an image of the zoning map amendment stretching across the project area. Next slide. And here's a closer look of the bird's eye view of the proposed zoning districts now lo looking northwest. A lower density contextual district, M14R7X, would be mapped across from the R5 district where there are three and four story residential uses immediately adjacent. A higher density district, M15R91, would be mapped along Northern Boulevard to support the proposed towers and office program there. As mentioned, Northern Boulevard is a wide street that can support additional density. An M14R9 district would be mapped to support the mix of uses and building designs along 35th and 36th Avenues and Steinway Street. And an M14 R73 districts would be mapped at the mid block, resulting in lower density conditions. The regulations of each of the districts 
is shown in the table on the lower right with FARs ranging from six to nine and maximum building heights ranging from 185 feet to 28, 280 feet. Together, the mapping of these districts would facilitate the proposed development at an overall FIR of 7.1. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, here's another view of the massing looking southeast from 35th Avenue. As mentioned, the applicant team is seeking bulk waivers, and you can see where the overall height plane is and where the height waivers would apply. Broadly, the waivers would allow for distribution of density on wide streets, including 35th Avenue and Steinway Street, and the framing of the central open space on Block C, as well as rear yard waivers on Blocks B, C, D, and E. With the proposed zoning districts, nine of the 13 proposed buildings would be allowed at the heights proposed as of right, pursuant to the regulations of the districts. Only four would not, and the applicant seeks relief in these locations on blocks B, C, D, and E. Next slide. According to the applicant team, the height waivers would help create a unique and distinct built form that supports good urban design and a better site plan. Next slide. The applicant seeks waivers for setbacks in certain locations around five blocks, ranging from five to 15 feet. The waivers correspond to additional at-grade buildings, setbacks to create articulated facades without setbacks and ensure ample pedestrian circulation space and light and air to the streets. For example, the building facing Playground 35 and the open space on Block C are proposed with sheer street walls fronting on Steinway Street. On 41st Street in the mid-block and southern locations, a setback waiver is sought on the west side of the street to accommodate a shallow interior lot condition offset by corresponding at-grade setbacks on the east side of the street, ensuring light and air and additional pedestrian space on the narrow street. Next slide. The proposed development seeks waivers for mid-block rear yards and rear yard equivalents on portions of the buildings on blocks C, D, and E. For residential uses and quality housing developments under the proposed zoning districts, a 60-foot rear yard equivalent located midway between two opposite streets of the block would be required. In addition, for commercial and community facilities, a 40-foot rear yard equivalent located midway between two opposite streets is required. Certain buildings on each block would be partially located within these rear yard equivalents. However, according to the applicant, they would be located in areas that allow for residential uses to receive ample light and air from adjacent setbacks, streets, and the new public open spaces. The waiver of the rear yard equivalent on block D would also allow for the multiplex cinema to be constructed evenly across the block, which would provide improved layouts for each theater within the multiplex. Next slide. The applicant team proposes to modify signage regulations for the cinema on block D in order to allow for larger signs that would, according to the applicant, highlight cinematic offerings and provide better wayfinding for moviegoers. The CPC may permit such modifications, again, provided that such modifications would result in a better site plan. There are two locations of modifications. The first is a waiver along 41st Street, along the western facade of the cinema, as seen in the key plan. 400, uh, this would involve a 400 square foot wall sign located within an area as shown in the diagram. The second is along 35th Avenue, a wall, a wall sign as we'll see in the following diagram, as well as a 100 square foot blade sign seen in this elevation. Next slide. The 35th Avenue frontage wall sign will be non-illuminated with a maximum of 150 square feet of, of surface area located within the hatched area of this diagram. Next slide. The applicant seeks to distribute parking spaces across the development site and the CPC may permit such distribution, provided that again, the distribution would result primarily in a better site plan and that it would not draw excessive traffic through the local streets. As the diagram shows, all blocks would provide parking in the cellar level with entrances shown in brown here. 
The applicant proposes to distribute 16 spaces from block E to block A, which due to the block configuration is larger and can accommodate more spaces. Next slide. The applicant also seeks to reduce the loading birth requirements on several of the blocks, and the CPC may permit such reductions of births provided that deliveries and any resulting traffic would not interfere with the functioning of streets and that the reduction would provide for a superior site plan. The applicant proposes loading birth reductions in four of the five blocks with proposed entries shown in purple on the diagram. The list on the left shows the required number of loading births per block and the number that are being proposed with the modifications. Next slide. Finally, the applicant seeks flexibility in citing certain large retail establishments, which would otherwise be restricted in floor area access across the development site. The CPC may permit such stores with no limitations on floor area, provided that, similar to prior findings, the uses proposed would not impair the essential character of the surrounding area, and that such uses would not unduly affect traffic or congestion on local streets. In seeking relief, the applicant proposes this flexibility across the majority of the development site with waivers applying to those locations shown in pink. Next slide. Although the non-applicant owned sites are not currently proposed to be redeveloped as a result of the actions, the applicant has determined that, given the increase in density, projected development could be possible across the project area. The scenario that's shown here shows as much as uh, 773,000 square feet of mixed-use development that could occur across blocks A through E, generating roughly 809 residential units, more than 200 of which would be permanently affordable, and 85,000 square feet of ground floor retail along with parking to support the uses. While these projected development sites are not being proposed as part of the application, this reflects a possible full build out of the five block site. Next slide. A notice of completion of a draft environmental impact statement was issued on April 22nd, and impacts were found in multiple categories, including community facilities, open space, shadows, transportation, air quality, and construction. The applicant is working to mitigate the impacts in these categories, and that work will be ongoing until uh, September 8th, when the FEIS is scheduled to be published. Next slide. On June 21st, Queens Community Board 1 held a public hearing and voted to disapprove the application without conditions, with 24 in favor, eight opposed, and three not voting for cause. Although there were no conditions associated with the vote, the board provided a long list of recommendations, some of which are summarized here, but we're primarily focused on the perception that the project is out of scale with the surrounding neighborhood context. Recommendations including reducing height along 35th Avenue and maintaining the highest height and density along Northern Boulevard, which would alleviate shadows that are cast on Playground 35 and the surrounding residences. The board recommended removing the special permit to allow for retail uses larger than 10,000 square feet and requested additional active recreation space, such as a soccer field or a basketball court. Next slide. The Queensboro president held a public hearing on June 30th and on August 4th recommended disapproval of the application with a long list of conditions. These include that the applicant commit to making 50% of the units permanently affordable, provide tenant relocation reports to the borough president and council member, create a community advisory board for the project, reduce density and include more active recreation space based on the community board's recommendations, and commit to local hiring, discounted commercial rents, additional sustainability measures, and accessible design throughout the project. Next slide. In conclusion, the applicant team is proposing a zoning map amendment, three zoning text amendments, and multiple special permits in order to modify bulk, signage, parking, loading, and use regulations in order to facilitate the development, which would include nearly 3 million square feet, 7.1 FAR, approximately 2,800 dwelling units, 711 of which would be permanently affordable, 
roughly a half million square feet of commercial and community facility space, and more than two acres of open space. The applicant will be available to answer questions at Wednesday's public hearing, but I'm happy to answer any that the commission has at this time. Thank you. Great, thank you, Joy. And uh, thanks to you and to the Queen's team for all of your hard work on this. We know that you have put an extraordinary amount of time and energy into um, shaping and guiding this proposal and uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I, I wanted to just probe on a few areas and then I'm gonna to turn to my colleagues here. Um, and let me just off the bat say, I know that this has been uh, a project that has been uh, challenged and significantly in the public process today. You noted the negative recommendations coming out of the community board and the BP. Um, also, on the other hand, a significant potential investment in the city and an opportunity here uh, to uh, re-envision an area uh, which, um, you know, really could use this opportunity. Um, there are a few issues, however, that are still outstanding, at least from an environmental perspective. Um, you noted that there were a variety of uh, impacts that had been identified. Um, are there any uh, unmitigated impacts that remain? Yes, um, there are still some, and that's pretty typical with a draft uh, environmental impact statement, but the applicant team is working to mitigate some of those impacts, um, one of which is the active recreation impact. So they, they're providing a, about two acres of open space, but there's still this active recreation impact um, that could be mitigated by providing a basketball court or a soccer field or some sort of um, active recreation space. So they are providing certain portions of the open spaces active rec already, but um, that's still one that's an open mitigation. Okay, well, we'll certainly probe that with them on uh, Wednesday when we see them. Let's talk about um, density for a moment, um, or at least uh, the, the bulk waivers. Um, I'm looking at slide 30 right now. Um, there are uh, a couple of buildings on either side of what is expected to be that, what, what I would describe as the grandest open space area on, um, on lot C, which is bordered by two buildings, one on lot B and one on lot D, each of which they're seeking a waiver uh, to have a straight up um, frontage on, um, I guess that is on Steinway Street and 41st Street. Um, uh, is is that an area where we should be considering, um, you know, exploring alternatives here in terms of where some of those uh, setbacks should remain or where we might want to shift some of this around? Um, it does feel like that might um, make that open space, which otherwise is pretty important and, um, you know, very attractive area, somewhat a little bit more uh, closed off. Sure. Um, yeah, that's definitely something that could be considered. Um, we have been working with the applicant team on various urban design solutions to be more responsive to the community board's uh, concerns, but those are certainly areas we could look at in shifting some bulk around and providing a little bit more light in there. And as you think about shifting bulk, if at all, would the, would the priority be to move bulk toward Northern Boulevard and 36th Avenue, or is it to do, I mean, that looks certainly like the way the site plan is designed uh, here, but if you were to, if we were to make any moves or if you were to make any suggestions to them, is that the area, is that the direction uh, that you would uh, encourage? Absolutely, yeah. Um, and that's been consistent guidance throughout this whole process. Uh, and that's also something that the community board aligns on as well as seeing a lot of the bulk of the project shifted towards Northern Boulevard, that 100 foot wide a major thoroughfare in Queens, and especially away from the residences on 35th Avenue, which have become a very sensitive topic because they are lower scale. There's three to four stories tall. Um, and also keeping bulk away from the side streets, which are also very narrow. Okay, got it. Um, the parking spaces, uh, they're proposing 1390. The required number here is what? I believe it's 949 spaces. So they are proposing more spaces than are required by zoning. And what is the rationale for the extra 400 and change uh, units here? 
Um, I can let the applicant speak more to that, but I understand they've done some transportation analysis, especially with the cinema use, um, sort of figuring out what the right combination of transportation would be um, in terms of parking spaces, and they came to that number, but uh, yes. We'll ask them. Okay, good. I'm, uh, I'm saying this in loud, out loud, at least in part, to just uh, uh, make sure that uh, they know that I will be asking them about it, and also... Let me just, for my own interest, can you go back to slide, slides 18 and 19? Um, there is an interesting chart in the corner uh, of each of these, which relate to the 15 minute city. Can you just uh, explain how that relates to what we're looking at here? Yeah, so I'll preface this by saying that these are materials that were created by the applicant team, but um, the idea of the 15 minute city generally is just to have a variety of uses within about a 15 minute walk. So the applicant here is proposing um, a large mixed use development across five blocks that would have office space, that would have retail spaces, community facility spaces and residences that would create a 24 hour community essentially. Um, so ideally you would have a lot of uses available to you both culturally um, and retail related within a 15 minute walk. And can you explain how this chart works? I see have activity on one axis and time on the other. And then I have three different colors, green, pink, and blue. Presumably they relate here to the items that are also on the map. But if you could just lay that out for us, and I recognize this is not a city planning document, but if you could just explain it for those who may be watching or listening, because I think it is interesting. And also I, it was not immediately obvious to me when I saw this. Sure. Um, I may let the applicant team explain in more detail, but I do believe that the green would represent open space and the amount of time it would take to walk. Um, so that open space and the blue being the community facility spaces that you see highlighted here and sort of the amount of time uh, and distance across the site. But I'll let them speak more in detail about that. On All right. Day. Well, let's yeah, let's definitely do that because it looks it doesn't really it doesn't really make sense to me with the way it's written <laughs> it looks like it takes um, you know 17 hours to to get to find some of these uh, spaces or uh, but I, I know that that is not the point of that chart so we will ask them about it on Wednesday um, and uh, and I am going to go to my colleagues in the commission here and see if there are questions um, and we will then pick this up with the applicant and with the public on Wednesday let's see if there are questions Commissioner Rampershad. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Chair, I share the same line of thinking with regards to the park uh, between Block D and, well, the park's not located on Block C, but I actually drove by the site yesterday and I, you know, I'm trying to envision what it's going to look like with a 22 story building and a 16 story building. So I do think that we should probably look into the bulk of that in that regard. Um, one thing I would just ask is, um, on Block D, I know they said they had the movie theater proposed on that, and there's going to be an open space. Is it possible that the applicant team can show some street view looks at that, how it's going to be that open space? Sure. Because I know we don't have it in our package. And if possible, if they have any shadow diagrams, if they can also share with us. I know we're still waiting for the final report, but if possible, if they can share that during their presentation on Wednesday. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Um, I will say we're working with the team a little bit more on the block D PAA space. It's the only open space that's covered in the project area. Um, I will get some views of that and have them ready to share, but we're working with them to open that up a little bit more and make it feel more accessible to the public, because I know that's been a concern that's come up in public hearings. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, let me see if there are others here. Okay, Joy, thank you very much. Uh, we will um, uh, look forward to taking this up with the applicant team and with members of the public uh, on Wednesday. But again, thank you. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on. Late breaking. Vice Chairman Knuckles, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just was wondering, thank you, Chair. Uh, Joy, uh, subsequent to the borough president's uh, recommendation, has there been any outreach on the part of the development team to his office? And um, do you know what, if anything, has uh, come out of that? Um, that's a great question. We received their recommendation on Thursday. Um, so I'm not sure if there's been any more conversations between the applicant team and the borough president's office, but I can have them speak a little bit more to that. 
And I think Commissioner Bozorg had her hand up. I'm okay, actually. Um, okay. Thanks. Good, good spot, yeah. but it does not say, are you there, Commissioner? Yeah, I, I'm okay, actually. You're clear? Okay. Yeah. I'm <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. We're going to give a final call here. I certainly don't want to miss anybody. I don't see any other hands. Okay. Joy, thank you again. Thank you. We appreciate it. Okay. Um, Ryan, what's next? Certainly. The fourth item on our agenda is a pre hearing review of a UDAP designation and disposition of city owned property and an urban renewal plan amendment in Brooklyn Community District 5. And Connie Chan is our presenter. Connie. Good afternoon, commissioners. This project was certified on April 25th and the public hearing will be held this Wednesday, August 10th. Next slide. This project is located in the southeastern part of East New York in Community District 5, Brooklyn. The New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development is requesting a UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition for Site 26A in the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Area, or URA, as well as changes to the Urban Renewal Plan, or URP, for this area to facilitate a new 100% affordable eight-story building with approximately 200 units for seniors, uh, including community facility space. HPD is also requesting technical changes to the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Plan, which would support the final phase of this affordable residential unit, that planned unit that is uh, that was previously approved for within the site um, at site five. Next slide. So before I discuss the application at hand, I want to um, flag the location uh, of another project that is currently in ULERP. That's the Innovative Urban Village East New York Christian Cultural Center application. So that project is shaded in pink in the upper left-hand corner of this image. Um, and that project area is located approximately half a mile west um, from the subject of this application. So the boundaries of the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Area are outlined in the dotted white line. It's roughly bounded by Flatlands Avenue to the north, Fountain Avenue to the east, the Belt Parkway to the south, and Hendricks Creek to the west. The northern part of the URA contains primarily residential developments, as well as a school and neighborhood retail and services along Elton Street. The Gateway Center Mall comprises the southern portion of the URA. Development Site 1, or Gateway Site 26A, is the senior housing project, which is located in the northeast section of the urban renewal area. Next slide. Development Site 1, or Site 26A, and much of the surrounding area is zoned R6. Site 26A also has a C24 commercial overlay. Next slide. Development Site 1 is a vacant, approximately 35,000 square foot lot, it is currently designated for public and semi-public uses, which the urban renewal plan defines as community facility and commercial uses. The parks department recently completed Berryman Playground, which you can see directly west of development site one. Next slide. This is the site plan, uh, which is rotated about 90 degrees clockwise from the previous views. So again, this is a 100% affordable development that will contain 191 uh, units for seniors. In total, the building will have 130,000 square feet at an FAR of 3.76. At its highest, the building is eight stories, which you can see in the gray uh, the labels here. But you can also see that portions of the building will step down to six and four stories. And there's a resident courtyard um, in the middle facing Berriman Playground, which is along the north edge of this image. Next slide. Here is the ground floor plan, which shows the different entries located along Erskine Street and Vandalia Avenue. It also shows the ground floor residential units in yellow and the ground floor com community facility space shaded in blue. Next slide. So here are a few renderings um, and we're looking at from here at the southeast corner where the main residential entrance is located. Next slide. This is a view from, Bear, from above Behrman Playground, and you can see the resident courtyard at the center of the image. Next slide. And here is a view um, along the north side from Vandalia Avenue, and you can see how the building form steps down towards Behrman Playground, which is on the right side. Next slide. So I'm going to move on to development site two, which encompasses phase five of the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Plan, and that's shaded in yellow at the top of this image. 
Next slide. Development site two or phase five is comprised of sites on blocks that are bounded roughly by Flatlands Avenue, Elton Street, Vendelia Avenue and Gateway Drive. Next slide. This is a portion of the existing land use plan for the Fresh Creek Urban Renewal Area. And this shows the URP site numbers and the designated uses. Next slide. HPD is proposing to merge the sites on each of the two blocks west of Ashford Street and north of Egan Street, which would form sites AB and site EF. They are merging these sites in order to build out phase five with larger apartment style buildings, which are more efficient to construct than the smaller scale buildings that were originally planned. Next slide. The proposed massing for phase five is shown here. There would be nine buildings of either 40 or 80 units each. The total number of units for phase five, which is 560, would remain unchanged and buildings would remain limited to four stories. Next slide. In summary, there are two actions being requested. To facilitate the development for site 26A, HPD is requesting a UDAP designation, project approval and disposition, as well as several changes to the URP that would allow this project to be built. And additionally, HPD is requesting several technical changes to the URP to facilitate a change in building typology for phase five. Next slide. Community Board 5 held a public hearing on July 19th, and they have yet to issue the recommendation. The Borough President held a public hearing on July 21st and issued a recommendation to approve the application with conditions, and I will come back to those conditions shortly. Next slide. So uh, an update from discussions that have happened during Mueller. Uh, Community Board 5 raised concerns regarding the need for some parking spaces following their observations of increased street parking usage in the area. Um, and this is for uh, site 26A. As you may recall, the applicant obtained a mayoral zoning override for the 26 parking spaces at development site one or site 26A that would have been required pursuant to the underlying zoning. The project as shown at certification did not provide parking spaces for that building. In response to the concerns that the community board raised regarding parking, HPD has made revisions to the site plan for site 26A. Uh, and the site plan, the revised site plan is shown here. Uh, you can see that 10 parking spaces uh, will be provided in a portion of the courtyard, which would be accessed through a curb cut on Schroeder's Avenue, where the dark blue arrow is located. The area that's affected by this change is shaded in light blue. This modification will result in the reduction of two dwelling units from a total of 191 to 189. Those units were originally proposed to be located at the ground floor where the vehicular drive would provide access to the parking spaces in the rear of the building. In addition, this change would reduce the size of the courtyard from approximately 9,000 square feet to approximately 4,200 square feet. Next slide. So now coming back to the borough president's recommendation, which was again to approve with conditions, his condition was to remove the newly proposed 10 parking spaces and restore the two dwelling units that would be lost, as well as the full size and extent of the original courtyard. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Connie. Uh, and I'm sure we will explore that point about the 10 parking spaces in the courtyard and the community board versus the borough president's recommendations on Wednesday. Let me just ask um, the, the, the history of the sites that are being proposed for the development here, Obviously, they're part of this uh, urban renewal plan. They are these are vacant sites today. They're both vacant sites. That's correct. And what is the what what is the, the what is the the history here? They how long have they been vacant? Are they uh, what were they over time here? I believe they have always been vacant. Site twenty six A was designated um, uh, in the URP as kind of public and semi public uses. I think previously it had been envisioned that potentially a childcare would be located there, and now. The, the application in front of you envisions a mixed use project with community facility as well as a senior housing component. For phase five, that uh, that phase five was subject to a previous approval. So that, pro that portion of the project has already been approved and they're back now because they're seeking a, a different building typology, even though the total number of units would remain unchanged. I see, okay, got it. Thank you very much. Sure. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Osorio. Thanks so much for the presentation. I was wondering if you can expand a little bit on the vulnerability of the site to coastal flooding. It sounds like 
it may be vulnerable, especially on on towards the residential units. But I was wondering if you can explain a little bit uh, what type, to what extent has this been analyzed? Um, this is a great question. I don't have a, a wonderful answer for you at the moment. I think maybe what we can do is we can have the applicant address that in the public hearing, the extent to which uh, both of the sites are vulnerable to flooding um, and, and what thought has gone into that as part of those development plans. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Connie, for your thoughtful presentation and for your work on this. And we will move this one to a public hearing on Wednesday and we'll look forward to seeing the applicant team at that point. Um, Ryan, I think we're out of our pre-public hearing review uh, section of today's agenda and on to um, some other good stuff. That's right. Uh, so we have the fifth item on our agenda is a city council modification scope determination for the Lirio MTA site at uh, 806 9th Avenue. Uh, Andy Cantu is here to present. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners, old and new. Um, Jeff, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so as uh, Chair Garadig mentioned, um, the modifications to the Lirio application were voted out by city council subcommittees on zoning and franchises and landmarks, public sightings and dispositions uh, the last week of July. City council modified the zoning map amendment and zoning text amendments, which I'll go over in a little bit. Uh, and DCP staff have determined that these changes are within scope. Next slide. On your left uh, is a map of the rezoning boundary for the certified application. As you can see, the, the rezoning boundary of the proposed, which is the black dotted and solid line, uh, the rezoning boundary of the proposed C62 commercial district included the development site, which is outlined in red, uh, owned by the MTA, of course, uh, and six lots or portions of lots ad adjacent to the MTA site. The certified C62 rezoning area extended 150 feet west from 8th Avenue, where it would have abutted a C64 zoning district. On your right is the zoning map as modified by city council. They reduced the size of the rezoning area to just include the development site and a small sliver of a privately owned parcel fronting on 9th Avenue. Uh, and completely excise the out parcels to the east. Uh, so those would remain R8 with a C15 commercial overlay along 53rd Street. Next slide. The second change the city council made was to the zoning text amendment. There is an, a, an existing uh, CPC special permit that allows for sites in the special Clinton district preservation area to waive height and setback regulations under certain conditions. Uh, and as you may recall, the certified application expanded that special permit mechanism to allow for waivers from other bulk regulations, including uh, yard and lot coverage rules. Uh, and that expanded special permit was to be uh, consolidated along with the height and setback waiver and relocated to its own new dedicated section in the zoning resolution. Uh, in addition, the text amendment created three conditions that limited the uh, eligibility for bulk waivers uh, to two sites only, the MTA site and the DEP site, which is the Rialto West. Uh, and again, those three conditions were that the zoning lot had to be 40,000 square feet, it had to front on a wide street, and it had to contain existing public infrastructure. Next slide. And as you'll recall, the commission uh, during its review period, based on feedback from the community, modified the certified application to further specify that the special permit was limited to a mass transit or water supply support facility rather than uh, infrastructure generally. Uh, and the intent here was to just be as explicit as possible that this special permit was only available to the MTA and the DEP sites. It didn't actually further limit the applicability to fewer sites. It just was to be, uh, the intent was just to be uh, completely explicit about what these special permit applied to. Next slide. 
and city council made a further modification to the text. So rather than create a new special permit section, uh, the text allowing for the additional relief from preservation area bulk rules was retained in the existing zoning resolution section 96104, which already contains the height and setback waiver. Uh, and in addition, council added a fourth condition uh, limiting the availability of bulk waivers to developments that include affordable housing, uh, which of course the MTA, the Lirio site and the DEP projects uh, do. Uh, so those were the changes that were made and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. And just uh, for uh, clarity for the group and for anybody watching, so the question before the commission today is one of scope, whether these changes that have been made by the city council uh, are within the scope of the environmental review. And Andy, it sounds like um, your conclusion is that they are. Staff's conclusion is yes, they are. Yes, okay. Commissioner Bernie. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, this is not the first time and it seems fairly common that the council rolls back the boundaries to specifically the site of the applicants, whereas the department and the commission has taken a broader view of not spot zoning, but creating a slightly broader boundary. And I'm wondering, because this happens so frequently, is there some sort of philosophical or theoretical difference of opinion between the department and the commission and the council on this topic? Because it does come up quite often. Uh, it's a great question. I think from the department's perspective, um, you know, our intent is to, um, it's twofold. It's to um, implement the development goals of the project, um, but it's also to create a rational zoning boundary, um, which we believe that, you know, the original certified application uh, does and we don't we don't disagree that the new zoning boundary as proposed by city council uh we don't think it's necessarily irrational um it's just sort of a six in one hand half dozen in the other kind of situation um like you said a difference of opinion yeah i'm just wondering it happens so frequently whether we can come to some agreement so we don't keep having to send stuff over that gets amended i mean we can See, see if we can see eye to eye on that topic, perhaps. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, it seems that uh, the agreement that the council might like would be for us to send individual sites, but I don't think that that is our, our priority over here. So you're correct to flag this as an issue. And uh, it is it certainly is um, uh, a point of, of concern. And uh, we're going to continue to work on that with the council because uh, Obviously, it, it is a it's, uh, it's a it's a continuing continuing um, issue for us. Yeah. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, okay, uh, let's see if there are other questions or comments. Okay, seeing none, I'm just going to uh, at this point seek a, a voice vote uh, for the finding that uh, these modifications are within scope. Uh, so. With that, I'm going to ask for assent by voice vote to send a letter to the city council uh, that these proposed modifications as described by Andy are within scope. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. nay. All right, the ayes have it. Thank you, Andy. Uh, let Thank us you. move on to future votes. Ryan. Uh, certainly. So for consideration on August 10th, uh, staff have prepared reports for uh, 2080 McDonald Avenue. Um, Connie, you wanted to, I believe you're covering this, correct? Uh, not not seeing Connie on. Um, my my understanding is that the staff, the staff, we've prepared a report for 2080 McDonald Avenue that is in support of the uh, proposed rezoning and text amendment, um, citing the uh, two wide streets, the proximity to transit, um, and the uh, additional affordable housing. We believe that the commercial overlay. Uh, is appropriate on uh, what is a, a 
existing commercial street. And further, there is a, a portion of the rezoning, which is across uh, Avenue S from the applicant site, which is being rezoned, um, perhaps, uh, let's say, to the point of uh, just uh, that Commissioner Bernie raised, that, that the commission or that the commission, the staff um, feel is uh, appropriate to rezone uh, as that it is also a on a wide street and commercial area. And, uh, and even though it is not the applicant's controlled site, that it is uh, you know, part of a rational land use uh, plan and a uh, complete plan to include it. Uh, I see Commissioner Dweck, your hand is up. Yeah, yeah, I would just, thank you. I, I would just note the uh, unanimous uh, consent of the uh, community board, which we usually don't see on projects. So. That's right. Yes, sir. No. There has been uh, some support for this from the community board as well. So, all right. And then uh, also for consideration on uh, August 10th is 2017 Grand Concourse. Camilla, you had uh, something you wanted to say about this? Uh, yes, we do. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, the Department of City Planning recommends the approval of this um, proposed UDAP designation project approval and disposition of city-owned property. These actions would facilitate the development of 33 units of affordable housing on the site, where today there are vacant and dilapidated structures. It would help to meet the goals of the 2017 Jerome Avenue neighborhood plan by utilizing city-owned property to create affordable housing at a range of incomes that would include formerly homeless seniors. The scale of the project development and its design features would match the surrounding character as well as the re requirements of the special grand concourse district. The proposal meets the intent of the city's authority to acquire and dispose property through the Euler process. Thank you. Thanks, Camilla. Thanks, Camilla. All right, uh, for post-hearing follow-up, we have uh, 705 10th Avenue. This is the DEP site. And Ariel B is uh, here with an update. Ariel? Hi. Oh, you've muted, Ariel. There you go. OK. Uh, we are here to answer any of the questions that the commission may have on this project. That's right. I don't know if there are other questions on 705 10th Avenue and Ryan, I don't know if you, um, if, uh, if there's specific things to address here. Or no, I don't believe so. I okay. Could... All right. Just okay. Just Thanks, Ariel. About that. Thanks, Ariel. Sorry. That's okay. And do we have uh, other and updates on any of the remainder here? Or? So for Morris Heights NCP and the Morris in your open door, if there's any further questions, do let us know. Um, the Bruckner sites rezoning, there was a letter in your package. Uh, and so if there are any further questions on that, um, there's staff here to answer. And that uh, same for the 9th Street rezoning in that uh, staff is here to answer any questions. I know there was a lot of material submitted on that um, after. Great. The so let's let's see if, uh, if there are questions now. And obviously, uh, is not the only opportunity here, uh, but if uh, people do have questions at this stage, we have staff ready to go. Questions from the commission on any of those? Okay. All right, Ryan, thank you. Is there anything else uh, for us today uh, uh, in our review session? No, Chair Ron, there's no further. Okay. Well, thank you very much to you and the entire team of the department. Um, I want to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, wait, wait, hang on. Commissioner Goodridge, sorry. Hi. Hi there. Um, hi. I just had. Um, well, I'm just going to make a a, a comment. Um, I, you know, I'm pausing because I'm processing my thoughts. But the long and short of it is, I'm very dismayed about the way that racial equity is being handled um, in by the commission. Uh, I know that obviously we have the new law, but a perfect example is that we have um, a nearly 2,500 unit project in one of the most diverse areas in Queens that we had a presentation on today. 
And, you know, by law, it wouldn't have to have submitted any kind of racial equity report. So that's one misgiving. The second is that, um, you know, I just want to say how demeaning uh, it feels, quite frankly, um, to be on here and to hear, for example, that, you know, the, the applicants and developers don't have to submit a report, but they do. And then when they do, it is just like a line about income. Um, so essentially, they're equating like race and class, which is really not the same. It's, you know, most of them that I've heard is like, will provide jobs. Um, but it really isn't the basis of what we had um, the racial equity initiatives for. So, you know, my question, which I already know the answer to is, why, why is it that really racial equity and even just demographics couldn't be in the reports um, by the commission? We already have the data tool um, and that information obviously that's been given to the developers isn't, I mean, I, I haven't really heard a serious answer, quite frankly. Um, and so I don't know why this information couldn't also be buttressed, um, developed by the commission as well. And, you know, even today, the Landmark Commission, the, the Landmark Preservation person, they mentioned it um, and spent some time on it. So that would be an example. And I just wanted to say that I don't really think that at least to me from where I'm sitting, um, that it's been really a serious discussion. Um, I will uh, take a, a, a crack at, at the conversation because I think also we're still figuring out uh, what we present on the uh, racial equity report. And the, act, the reports actually have quite a bit, have a wealth of information and there was, an, and it's just a decision, we didn't have any sort of reason for it because to discuss the um, affordability levels that were uh, discussed as part of the report. And that's primarily because we know that that is a topic of conversation that happens during the ULIT process. But there are um, many demographic uh, pieces of information in the reports. We can oh, no, add those. No. To this, the to the presentation and are happy to do so. I have to say, if it was a grade, it would be an F, really. Um, it's it's they're not there's no racial demographics that are. This is what I'm saying. The demo it's a the, the the whole purpose was for racial equity and the use of like income and all these other things that really don't address race or even you know address who's being displaced is not the same. And I have to say that it's really denigrating and demeaning. Um, quite frankly, um, for it to be handled this way, because it's not the way that advocates advocated for it. And, and sitting on the commission, and obviously it's a very diverse commission, and there are a lot of very diverse planners, but they're following, they're following orders. Um, and so, you know, I, I, and the other thing is, I was on the racial equity team, and there was no black person on the team. I don't even think there was an Asian person on the team. Um, I was part of a racial demographics meeting for Crown Heights, it was one black woman and then the rest were uh, white or white passing, I'm not sure, but um, it's really not helpful. And it, and it actually is um, an extremely demeaning and bad look for New York City that this is the second time I have brought this up in a meeting and certainly not the second, it's probably the fourth time I brought it up even privately and there's still like we're working on it and I'm not really sure what there is to work on. It's just like include demographics and the information in the reports and take it seriously. So I, I wanna, uh, and we can, I can drill down on this with you at another time as well, but I also wanna understand, so the, the racial equity reports themselves, we provide to the commission and have, like I said, they have a lot of this information. And and again, we can add and supplement this, the, this is uh, the racial equity report is new and we can continue to refine it. Is that is that the report that you're referring to or do you, and we can also also add these these information this information to the CPC report. Now that we have it being generated for these reports, we will speak to it into the commission reports as well. That's what I've been asking. I asked this question like 3 months ago. I've asked this question about 3 times about it being incorporated. 
And my main issue is that I do not want to have to go to a separate website, a separate, you know, to read, it should really be incorporated. Why is it like the whole, it should be incorporated in the presentations, incorporated in the reports, incorporated in the conversations. It doesn't, it should not have to be extra work to go and do to, I went on the equitable, equitable data tool, but like I said, I don't, I'm not going and using that separately. This is New York City. We are 25% Black, 28% um, Latinx, 14% Asian, you know, and at some point, like, you know, this, this, it's a very diverse city. And I don't like the way that after all the work of advocates that racial equity is being handled here. I've okay, brought this so, up about four right. times and, and I just want to make clear, I don't want to have any private conversations. That's, that's like additional DEI work for me. And I just, just commission needs to figure out, you know, whoever, I don't know who's getting promoted, who's dealing with this. I have no idea, but I'm from from being on here. It's 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 an F, really. I should I don't want to go to another racial equity meeting and there's no black or Asian people on it and it looked like it was mostly white, um, if not all. And that's part of the problem. And I and I and I feel quite frankly extremely frustrated that I'm bringing this up for the third time in a meeting. And it's the same response, which we're working on it. And it's, this isn't, I mean, not to say that it would be okay, but it's not, it's, this isn't like Salt Lake City, you know, um, this is a very diverse city. And I just feel like we can do better at this. And I certainly don't want to take my time out to do additional free DEI work. Like if, you know, it just feels very performative and I'm not entertained. Good. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, I will, I will note that, um, the uh, the reports are the reports are new, and what is being presented to the commission is just a subset of the report. The whole report is out there and it's available to the whole commission. Now, if it's if it's something that is not satisfactory, like these uh, these reports were obviously developed with advocates, with commission, with everybody. So right. it's it is what it is. Wait, hold, 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 give me a second. Yeah, you, commissioner, you that you have your chance. Let me let me let me say, and then obviously you're you're feel free to say anything you like. Um, you know, the, the question of how they should be incorporated into the conversation, that's up to the commission, that's up to the public, that's up to the council, that's up to all of us. The, the area in which I think that Ryan is trying to finesse and what he's really offering, and, and not, not as a matter for you, but also for all of us, is that one page snapshot that's being included right now as part of these proposals, is, is an effort by the staff here to try to digest a you know, voluminous amount of information to something that is you know, at least digestible. But we, that's what is the area where we can, we can maneuver, we can play around with it and try to make it more useful. The other stuff, the big report is out there and is, you know, has a lot of the information that you're, that you're talking about. So I, I, you know, and the other point I want to note is on this 2,500 unit project, this is one, I believe, Brian, that what came before racial equity reports were required. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. So they, they provided did. one voluntarily. Yeah. So this, you know, anyway, so that's the only, the only other thing that I, that I would, add. anyway, sorry, commissioner, you, yeah, the floor is yours. If you have more to say. The information that's being provided, and I and I was very clear about this. I did, I'm not this, you know. This is and this is a problem. This is not this, you know. The information that's being provided by the developers is not really addressing racial equity. That's my point. And the way that the information is being funneled and it's being incorporated, um, it isn't being incorporated, really. Um, it isn't really part of the conversation. And when people come here to testify, this is the May of the Blood Center, all of the, the Harlem Project, the main thing that they talk about is who's being pushed out by race. So, so I mean, I've been very clear about it. If it wants to be, if we want to sideline it to make it an issue of who's doing, I mean, obviously the planners are doing great work. I'm not blaming them. I'm saying that this is really a larger conversation that's beyond, they're following, you know, what, what's, you know, what, what yeah. 
square was a prop. So this has to be a larger conversation that I've brought up now for about three or four times. Yeah. And it hasn't really been taken seriously. So. All right. You're, it's a, it sounds like it's a, I understand it. It's a broad, I clearly understand it's a broader critique about the racial equity reports, not about the way that the staff here is presenting them to the commission. It's about what they actually include. And that's a, that's. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that the staff are following wh wh whoever. Well, they're following the, the law. Staff, I mean, these things whoever, were, fo commissioner, fo they were following, created. Following, following what, whatever is at the, whoever's at the commission. I don't blame the, ad, the staff are following orders. And so my, my question is, why aren't these, I think, I, I think I've been very clear if it wants to be turned into an issue of I'm blaming the staff instead of having a real look about how racial equity is handled in one of the most diverse cities. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Commissioner. Commissioner Osorio. Uh, thank you. I, I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk about uh, the, how the commission uses the reports and the, and what they entail. And, you know, as a new commissioner, somebody who, who's, who's really just at his first meeting, I, I wanted to ask whether there could be an opportunity for us to understand what is the plan? Like, what, what is, what is uh, where, where do we draw the line in terms of, you know, what's currently required, but also how can we use it to build on it and to frame our questions and support the staff and, and quite honestly vote uh, based on what that conversation is, is seeking for? Uh, we definitely can do a uh, a presentation about what it, how it came to be, what it is, how we can use it, how we could build on it. All of those points would be happy to do that, Commissioner. Thank you. That'll be extremely useful for, for me. Yep, you got it. Um, thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay. Um, all right. Well, thank you uh, for those observations. And let me just note uh, uh, my appreciation to the staff of the Department of City Planning for all of their work uh, on all of these applications. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday uh, at 10 o'clock for our public hearings on a couple of these items. Uh, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>